time opening. We have an eye, sort of a nostril, two teeth. Hmm. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. There it is. There it is. Much All better. right. Nice music. All, All right. right. Yeah. Well, welcome, to... everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Anatomy of a Movie. This week's operation is Catching Fire. I'm John Comerford, and I'm joined on the panel by... Hello, everyone. I'm Marissa Serafini. And good afternoon. Our, I'm Sarah Stratton. Hello, everybody. Dimitri Panos. How are you? Hello, and I'm Cami Martinez. And in the booth is... Phil Svitak. Hello, everybody. All right. Hello. So let's start off with overall impressions. I want to know, did it surpass your expectations? Did it fall short? What do you think, Marissa? Overall, because I love this series, and this, the books are amazing, and so I was really looking forward to this movie all year. It, I really... I was happy watching this, and it really fulfilled my expectations of this movie. I can I attest to that. I was there when she was yes. watching it, and she really did enjoy herself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't too. I wasn't upset mm-hmm. with this movie like a diehard fan might have been, but mm-hmm. I really enjoyed this movie. Sarah, on to you. Ah, mine. I'm very happy. I will see it again. I also read the books, so um, I was a little nervous because I hate going into movies with too high of expectations. Right. Because they often don't meet them. This one, I was trying to like really calm myself down and be like, just accept it. Just go in. <laughs> have fun. Um, and I think even if I had gone in with high expectations, they would have been met. Wow, nice. Well, it's being an endorsement. Please, Dimitri. Hey there. Uh, I, I read the books as mm-hmm. well. Um, I didn't go in with high expectations. I was not a big fan of the first Hunger Games mm-hmm. movie. So I sort of kind of, the, the bar was set low. I didn't mm-hmm. think you could make a worse movie, so that all you had to do was go up. And they did. They went up. I think they mm-hmm. upped the game, so to speak. Great. Uh, yeah, and I like okay. the movie a lot better than the first one. And Cammy. And uh, I agree with uh, the first four. I loved it. I thought it was great. I also read the books, um, so I was looking forward to it. I liked the first one. And then seeing this one, it actually exceeded my expectations. I thought it was amazing. I loved it better than the first Hunger Games, mm-hmm. and um, I, I've seen it twice now. There you go. Same okay. here. Good. And yeah. Phil, now I happen to know that you did not read the book, so you can tell us what you thought of the movie as it is. Well, yes. For me, um, you know, they I... I was really not looking forward to seeing the first one. Uh-huh. Um, I saw it three or four months after it had come out in theaters, actually. And uh, it took me by surprise because I actually enjoyed it a lot. And so I was looking forward to this one. Um, I didn't want to be part of the madness by seeing it opening night or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I saw it kind of at an obscure time. And uh, overall, I, I did enjoy it. Um, there, there's a few plot holes with the movie that, I, that are which, evident, which we'll, which we'll talk, to, mm-hmm. talk about. But overall, the experience was fun. Okay, and speaking of the things we're going to be talking about, we're going to get into the controversies that have crept up because of the release of the movie. We'll also be talking the opening weekend and the premiere that I think, uh, Phil, you have some interesting insights on that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, We'll talk about the cinematography cinematography and the different shooting style as opposed to the first movie. And where I want to start off is the filmmakers and the changing of the guard. But before we do, we didn't get, what what were your films? We'll keep going with filmmakers Mm, and the changing of the guards. (laughs) Well, do. So what I wanted to talk about was specifically that. I mean, so we've got a whole different crew. Yeah. And um, what do we think? Do, do we like this change? Were we happy about this change? We don't really know specifically why uh, uh, Ross was not brought back. No. Uh, and, and unless anybody has any, uh, in- I've got nothing. Con- I mean, there's nothing concrete. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it just seems usually when when a guy directs a movie that yeah. is so big for a company, usually, yeah. usually bring him back in yeah. one way, shape, or form because mm-hmm. he shaped. But then again, you can look at uh, what's her name, Cra- Catherine Hardwick, who directed the first Twilight movie. Is that okay. her name? Uh, I think, and she wasn't asked right. back. Yeah. So and I, you could you could easily make the argument that the mo- the books were so big that you could have any capable director in there, even if they did. Sure. do the first one and still be fine because you have such a great uh, fan base already Absolutely. as long as they're capable and let's let's, let's be honest there was some uh, conflict about his directing of the first one sure yeah and I think uh, you know I think that they they found a good director and crew in Francis Lawrence you mm-hmm. know one of the things I said I didn't like the first Hunger Games right. and partially I think because of the directing it had a lot of that what we've talked about before shaky cam mm-hmm. stuff and scenes that didn't need it and uh, mm-hmm. I yeah I just wasn't a big fan, but I think uh, uh, Francis Lawrence mm-hmm. uh, did a really very capable job. 
Uh, and he did something to me that was pretty sly. He turned the Hunger Games sort of kind of, he turned it into more of a, like an action movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt that's what the arena looked like, and he did a good job. Yeah, I think uh, they found a good guy to do it, and he's going to be doing Mockingjay's parts mm -hmm. one and two. And why not? If you can get a director to keep that theme going, and the movies will have that same feel and style. Mm -hmm. That's you know. That, well, that's by the way, it wasn't we, you know interesting. It wasn't just the director. Yeah, I mean, let's get into that. It, Thank you, Phil. Uh, you know, on the first movie, they had three editors. On this one, they just had one. Um, uh, Alan. Um, I'm gonna. I'll get his name. But you know, so there's a lot of apart from the actors that you see on screen, pretty much with almost everyone, everyone changed out except for perhaps James Newton Howard, the uh, composer on this movie. Well, but that makes sense too. It was uh, Alan Edward Bell is the name you're looking for regarding the editor. And he's worked with uh, Francis Lawrence before. He worked with him on Water for Elements. Uh, of Elements. Elephants. <laughs> Elephants. <laughs> so, you know, usually when a director comes in, he works yeah, with the people that he's comfortable with. Yeah, he usually with. brings them in. So, so that's, you know, right. I understand that. I don't see any... Uh, I don't see any like big controversy. No, because there. that's what you would really do. I mean, whatever director yeah. would come in, would he or she would want to bring in whatever crew they're comfortable with, yeah, as you just mentioned, or, the, or or unless there's some sort of agreement or arrangement they had with the previous cast or crew uh, that they were going to work on all three at the right. same time, which is rare when you do it with the crew. Tough. Yeah. The crew, mm -hmm. you, maybe the cast, but not necessarily the crew. And and I, you know, and and looking at the cinematography, they're mm -hmm. they're all going to be uh, Jill Willems who did the cinematography, and this is also going to be working on Mocking Jay's parts one and two, as well so, as the. Editor, well, let me so. just pose the question, just because there was there there. I mean, let's from the first one to the second one, there's obviously a different style in shooting. Mm -hmm. There's a different feel to the movie, they have a different look. Clearly, uh, all those similarities we had to uh, continue because you want to keep that thread going. But do you think that was a good change? Did you think it was a bump up to have a different... Uh, did Yeah, I do. I do okay. think so. And I think that that also comes with there's a change in the book. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens with a lot of series where not that the first book is like innocent because obviously the first book isn't. Right. But you need to learn more. You need to gain more on the like different worlds, the different planes, the different perspectives. And I think when you add in new directors throughout like the progression, mm -hmm. it, it works, it helps. You need that different perspective mm -hmm. because it needs to grow. Um, they did the same thing with the Harry Potters, like changing up yes. directors, yeah, changing up the feel, the tone. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the first person's, the first group or set of people who've been working on the film, they get so sucked into this one image of the world. Mm -hmm. You need someone who can give you these other angles or new, new twists. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, they did it, uh, you know, Harry Potter is a great example. Chris Columbus did the first two. He yeah. more or less set the table for everybody to work within that universe. Even go back to the original Star Wars. And mm -hmm. I call it Star Wars. I don't call it episode mm -hmm. of New Hope Four, or whatever. Yeah. You know, George Lucas, after directing yeah. it, pretty much said, ah, I never want to direct again. So he, he, you know, he gave the reins to other directors. Mm -hmm. And each Empire Strikes Back to Return of the Jedi had different looks. Yeah. You could say the same thing about Harry Potter. The James Bond series. Yeah, they always it, had. Well, they... they 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 keep a stable and but they change it up and sometimes they'll go back uh, you know mm -hmm. but it happens all the time uh, the same thing with like Star Trek movies any big franchise you it's know smart it's, to it's give not, other people a chance to play it's with not it. bad to get a new perspective can we make and a correlation that with the changing of this guard it made the movie better I yeah. think, I think so I think so okay. because you know Cam having uh, Sorry, Gary Ross as the first director he set the foundation for what the tone is of the mm -hmm. movie and like the atmosphere is going to be like and all the districts and locations that they're at and even in the second one yes they're in the same locations here and there but they always looked a little bit different and even the the cast members they changed around and in the first movie it was a lot of kids uh in the arena and then this time it's a lot of older adults so mm -hmm. even the the acting and what the tone's supposed to be like for that changes as mm -hmm. well yeah true okay so cammy what did you think yeah i agree i definitely think that it was a good change for the film like i said that i like yeah. the first the second one better i think that had a big play in it just to have the different perspective i think it was shot better um you know it had the better editing uh the cinematography i think that the crew was definitely a needed change and i think the games also you know Herbert Ross, or Gary Ross, I should say Herbert Ross. Jeez, yeah. now that's the 70s. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. No, Gary Ross, uh, you know, he made uh, the games a lot more grittier, mm -hmm. where in this one, the arena, is it's a different type of an arena altogether. Mm -hmm. So, you know, getting a new perspective on things, uh, you know, really helped. All right. 
All right. So let's, since we were talking about source material, then we want to go into uh, what you were just mentioning. It's a different look. But what I'm asking specifically is for those of us who've read the book, and I have not, uh, I want to know what you thought about how faithful it was in terms of uh, presenting itself as a good rendition. Are we going through good and bad, or <laughs> just, what, what, just whether the, or not it was either one you want, whatever right you want to talk about? I'm going to hand it over to the to the people who've read the book the most recently. Right, I, I you know <laughs> I'll be able to talk. There were two parts in both Hunger well, Games that I'll talk about, but okay, let me th- th- let me be more specific. Yeah. For those who love the book, and I assume you did, because mm-hmm, yeah, yes. mm-hmm. did did it uh, meet that expectation to go? Yeah, this was a good rendition of the book, or no, because they missed so much, or you know, because every time you read a book and then you see the movie, it usually. The, the movie falls short because there's so much you have to condense. What I'm asking is, did, did you feel that it was faithful to the book enough where you go, yeah, I, I think this was good? Yes, I think so. Because of reading the book, we always have our own interpretations and our own imagination of what the arena is or whatever thing is going to mm-hmm. look like. Uh, I had read the book recently and re- rereading it and then seeing the movie, I'm like, yes, it did stick to mm-hmm. it because they said it is a thermal hot place and a lot of forestry. Mm-hmm. And so I imagine like a jungle kind of thing. And you get, yes, Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, <laughs> but me reading the book, I imagine more like a battlefield, kind of like mm-hmm. a little bit of open ground with some a lot of shrubberies and trees around. But um, going back and then you have to have the water and beach. I'm like, there's no perfect place then right. to shoot Hawaii. So, yes, it did live up to the what visually what the arena was mm-hmm. supposed to look like. Were any, pos- any specific thing that they left out that you were going, how could you leave that mm-hmm. out? Yeah, there were. I we, think uh, that there were. I mm-hmm. also think that there were some trade offs that the movie has to like bring in to make it make sense to the audience. Visually, I personally think they captured a lot of the settings very well. Mm-hmm. Um, the train, the districts, uh, the arena, the capital, even into like their uh, progression in front of President Snow. Mm-hmm. All of that visually excited my imagination. I was like, this is great. Um, it does encapsulate what I what I envision. Um, things that they added that weren't in the book were specifically like the granddaughter of president snow mm-hmm. bringing her in and how she ties in kind of to how the capital is feeling towards her like mm-hmm. she is our one of our only clues as to how the capital is actually mm-hmm. reacting to katniss mm-hmm. besides what the they're fact, kind of worried about you yes, not turn into. besides the fact that we get them like chanting katniss as she's mm-hmm. entering um the procession yeah like that little girl is the key to like, oh, everyone wears their hair like this. Oh, mm-hmm. I want to be in love with her. She's one of the only reasons that we're seeing that people believe Katniss mm-hmm. or are on her side. Mm-hmm. I did like that arrangement. I also liked how it played into President Snow's frustration and his viewpoint and how he's kind of seeing how she's influenced or mm-hmm. impacting his people. Um, so that I thought was a good point, and I thought it made it was a good use for the movie, as well as the scenes between President Snow and um, the new. I keep on. I just want to use. Thank you. Plutarch. I was like, we'll see more Hoffman. No. Um, <laughs> as well as the scenes we got through through them, I liked that addition. Things I didn't like. <sighs> Go ahead. Oh, well, there's a couple, and I know Dimitri and I share one of them, so yeah. I will definitely save that one for last, so you can go into that because. Um, I thought that, first of all, I I love actors. I think we'll get great news of them. For me, the love triangle that I've kind of envisioned between Peta and Gail and Katniss is kind of lacking. I see that there are moments where they, they seem to be really in love and you get the reaction shots of people being like, oh, maybe they do care about each other, like their kisses. But I haven't seen why they're falling in love. Um, I see moments where I'm like, oh, yeah, that looks like they're in love. But I haven't found the reason why. And I thought that there was an opportunity for that. Mm -hmm. They really built up Peter's character in this. Like, they give him more opportunities where he, like, writes his own speech. He's becoming his own. You can see his viewpoint being, like, established. But I didn't – I haven't seen them go through that. Like, I don't – like, it just seems like Katniss is putting on an act at certain points, and I don't see why she loves him hmm. or anything. And well, as someone who hasn't ever read the books, I didn't know that she was really in love. I didn't think she was. Yeah, in love I, with him. I thought it was all. In I'll that. just take mm-hmm. one. I mean, I, this ain't Twilight. Mm-hmm. I, I never looked at these books as a mm-hmm. Camp Peter, Camp Gale kind of okay. malarkey. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I did use the word malarkey. Mm-hmm. It wasn't never okay, about. It goes along this. with Herbert Ross. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, of course. <laughs> Funny. Uh, it it just. Um, it was never about that to begin with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you read the 
if you've read the books and I think there is more compatibility if you're going to go down this route between she and Gail only because of their previous relationship. But what, what happens with PETA and again, it's it's I think it's pointed out in the books rather well is that mm-hmm. it was a fabrication. A lot of it. Mm-hmm. She gained respect for PETA early on, even in Hunger Games, you know, being the baker's son and, mm-hmm. and, and such. And she does. She she doesn't want PETA to get hurt. She understands that PETA is, uh, for all intents and purposes, an innocent. You know, he doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily belong in these games. And, you know, I think she she has a great care. She, she grows a great fondness for PETA. But I, I don't know. It, it's Twilight set this dopey mm. precedent for Hunger Games that shouldn't be. Okay. Yeah, that's I mean, the way I look the, at it that way. The thing is, is that mm. on screen, we see more of PETA mm-hmm. than we do of Gale. Mm-hmm. And, but in the books, we know that Gale and Katniss have had this friendship relationship that has grown a little bit over the years sure. and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And then when Katniss is actually thrown together with PETA throughout the whole thing, and yes, the their relationship was fabricated just so they can survive. True. Mm-hmm. And then everyone loved that, and that, that was the reason why they um, kept alive during the games, that sure. people were rooting for it. And then even after the games, they're still rooting for it, and they want them to be together. Like, the capital people want them to stay together. So, but throughout the book, yes, they point out just... Katniss's um, realization of what Peter uh, Peter is a how good she guy. Cares about yeah. them. Peter, she generally mm-hmm. cares like, yeah, it about is, it Peter. And that's thing. what I was saying, Kimmy. You you look like you were gonna. Mm-hmm. I was gonna it? say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that they they are doing a good job. I like the way they have the characters set up simply because in the second one when PETA says I don't have anything to live for, I don't mm-hmm. have any family or nothing. You know, nobody needs me, and she says I need you. And I, she has to fabricate this love, but I think in turn she does have a great fondness. She does love him, and again, she's young. Mm-hmm. I mean, she plays 16? 17, she's I think 17. she's in the, yeah, So I think be. it's also she's playing the typical 17-year-old where she has this guy at home, Gail, who she left mm-hmm. and she loves as a boyfriend, and then this guy that she needs to act and pretend like she loves, but she's also 17 years old. So it's mm-hmm. that kind of like brotherly love in a way, or you know, she feels like she has to protect him mm-hmm. in a way. Um, but there is a love and a fondness for PETA. Yeah, and Cammie, yeah. if I could bring up a point that you said, when PETA said that, can somebody... Talk about Did, how earlier he said well, something completely different. Yeah, and about <laughs> wait, didn't he have a family? I mean, yes, yes and yeah. he yeah. talks a, about them right. earlier and in like, the movie. I have a family yeah. to when, protect too. Yeah, when that came up, I was like, wait a minute, dude, you. Yeah. What do you mean you have nobody to live for? Like, you have a family that cares and loves for you. We know. I, I that scene in particular maybe, sort of kind of stuck out. Something happened to them between the time he said that. And yeah, they did the three finger exactly. salute. <laughs> well, they did. They did. They ended up, yeah. you know, they destroyed yeah. District Twelve. Yeah. So, but I think what he meant is he they, he didn't have people he was in charge of protecting exactly the, who, so much for her, like she had her mother, family. her sister. I, so so uh, he but, le- she legitimately cares for him. Peter? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 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 See, and you didn't get that. No, Good not friendship. at all. I thought most of it, you know, and it, she kept saying, look, save him. If anything happens, he's the one. And I'm going, why? I don't get why. I never saw why. It's like, well, is there something I'm missing? Is See, it yeah, in the I, I think the we've protector. lost that. I think we keep getting yeah. the end result. Like, this is what I want you to do. This is the kiss yeah, I love we, you. But we haven't we never seen saw. her build that. I didn't see it anyway. And I, I, I thought the whole thing was just a ruse just to... He, it's interesting yeah. survival going. and phil is is not have reading not have not having read, read, the, books. read the books like because i wonder if that would have changed if i would have looked at the movie be, looked at the movie differently phil mm-hmm. what, are, what are your thoughts on that on at that? the end of all of this i i never really <laughs> i never really thought that um katniss loved Peta. It wasn't. It, it wasn't until towards the very end that perhaps you know that was starting to happen. Um, you know, and a, and a lot of it early on. I mean, in terms of you talk about the qui- Twilight thing, I think a lot of the early part, and I I think I even want to say an hour and a half of this was just spent on that, mm-hmm. um, which I think was more to the fangirl, uh, you know, rather than perhaps let's say me or Dimitri because mm-hmm. we wanted to get to the Hunger yeah. Games. So I, I thought they did a really good job with that. No, oh, I'm serious. You, yeah. Why no, you no, laughing? No, no. Because you left me out of that. Well, you left me out of that category. <laughs> well, I feel like we do need to move on to more yeah. of these yeah, yeah, yeah. differences no, in catches. Absolutely. So before I this give Dimitri the last one, I do want to yeah. talk about one that I was really missing that I don't feel like a lot of people have talked about, which is the fact that we're not getting a lot of 
we didn't never got Hamish's backstory. We never got in the no. book. We do understand how he won his Hunger Games, right. and there's a lot of parallels and a lot of foreshadowing mm. given through how he wins. So, for those of you who just watched the movie and are planning to read the books, I am going to spoil it for you. <laughs> um, sorry, <laughs> don't listen to me for a minute. Basically, Hamish won the last quarter quell. Mm -hmm. So he's been through a, something where everything was changed on him. And we get to learn that he is smart, that he would have been a good ally, and that he knows what he's doing, mm -hmm. um, which we don't really get to fully understand in this film. We see him through so much, and we see him in the final frames, and obviously he's had so much to do with this planning. But we were never given the idea that he's like smart enough right. or to handle that. And also the way that he won was he used the force field mm -hmm. of the capital against them. And I believe he never actually even killed anyone himself or no, something. No, the, the axe bounced back. And yeah. So right. he never actually wow. killed anyone. He used the yeah, capital that good against to know. him. That's nice. yeah. It's very nice. It's because and it gives you a lot of layers to him. Yeah. And it also shows how Katniss uses the same strategy mm -hmm. and it being in force fields. And we do get in turn they gave us the beady and, and or the nuts and, and nuts and bolts. bolts. And um looking at the shimmering we get it there. Mm -hmm. But I liked that in the book it's tied to Hamish yeah. more. Mm -hmm. And it, it gives him more Footing okay. for all the planning he's done and all the defense we see uh, in support of Katniss. And to your Hamish point, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it Hamish in the books who says, Katniss, know who your enemy is or remember who your enemy is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't it is the Hamish. Finnick, yeah, yeah, it wasn't the Finnick character. And, he says you know, it in the movie and then Finnick repeats it. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. to me it was, uh, you know, the Hamish character in the books is is definitely a character that has an arc mm -hmm. um and at first watching hunger games i didn't quite think that woody harrelson was the haymitch that i picked up from the books mm -hmm. um you know he uh i don't know he just in in the book in the first one he's a he's a drunken loud he's overweight he's slovenly he's not mm -hmm. you know and in in this one catching fire he sort of kind of shapes up a little mm -hmm. um tries to knock off the sauce so to speak he doesn't drink mm -hmm. as Did much or, i didn't notice in, that in the book in the book yeah, yeah, you, don't, you haven't gotten to see no, any no, of no, that no, it's I'll, just I'll, yeah, yeah, he was a drunken loud he was a drunken loud <laughs> and, and, and it, does it seem very random that all of a sudden he's kind of there at the end with this planning absolutely right. so yeah. yeah i mean i'm going okay so i guess he's he, put one over on the government as well i mean right. i guess that was my thinking but no no he was really drinking so yeah he was really drinking and, and, and no. he also in the third book there's yet another mm -hmm. change for haymitch as right. well um but i thought yeah, it was way like, too much of a convenient twist to just mm -hmm. have him just uh, what all of a sudden he's doing this? no but okay, the, the third book really goes into the reason why haymitch is drinks we know he drinks we're led to believe that haymitch drinks to forget all the right. violence that he incurred right. that uh, occurred during the games, but in the third book, it talks. He also just like numbs the whole. He knows all okay. these spoilers, things. Spoilers, yes, spoilers. He, okay. but no, 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 he knows all these things gotcha. that he's trying to right. also drink. Like, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I mean, I understand it. Just like to me, Haymitch, Woody Harrelson at first. I, I, I'll say this: I liked Woody Harrelson's Haymitch better in this movie for mm -hmm. some reason more so than I did. In the and this, I think okay. they reined him in a little more because mm -hmm. the first one he was like barefoot and like look at me, <laughs> yeah. and, and then this one they right. seem to have given him more direction. So yeah. I thought he was better. But I, right. I, the reason I brought that up is specifically because of the fact that I think that everyone who hasn't read the books is totally missing that side of him, and it seems I random was. and I weird. Was. I yeah. was. Um, and and then, I think that would have been nice to have that yeah. layer to him because yeah. I think would I thought it would be far more interesting. And it also connects yeah. him and. Katniss so much right. more absolutely um, and yeah, it makes and me it, really go what is he got planned yeah. now I was like what yeah. exactly and, and also you don't, because you don't respect no. him as much yeah and also because in the first movie we're we're introduced to Hamish after Katniss mm -hmm. and Peter are uh, been called from the sure. reaping but this time we also see Hamish his reaction to knowing the fact that he's also in the reaping as well right. so we get his uh, his realization that he could be a part of the games again sure. too yeah so, do you uh, want to take the last one? Yeah, I know I mean, we're both yeah, kind well, of annoyed well, with this. Yeah, because it, it is. It's it's again. It's it's a small thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you know, whoever said you know, forget about the small stuff. It's all small stuff. Not so much, I think, in movies. Um, you know, you can omit a small thing that that's very relevant. And in the first Hunger Games movie, I, I, you know, I had a huge issue with the mocking Jay pin that that you're you're sporting looks Can very nice. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right there. It looks there. very nice. And in 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 the first 
movie, that pin was given to Katniss just before she was going to Capitol for training for, for, for the games. And she was in the governor of District 12, and it was the governor's daughter basically took her to another room and said, hey, look, it, it was a way of saying, we all support you. I'm giving you this pin. And she mm. says what the meaning of the pin means. She goes, and I want you to have this. This is like, in a sense, it's good luck, and it, and it means so much. I want you to have this. And it was a very important part in the book. The movie trivializes it where they go. She basically picks it up at a flea market. She's walking by. She sees the pin goes, oh, that looks nice. It's and free the lady, and there's no risk. Yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah. here, dear, have the pin. And I'm like, how do you do that? And I'm like, well, they, they, they can't do this in the second movie. And in the second movie, they take a very important part of the book mm-hmm. and they don't even showcase it. And it, it's a scene that uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman as mm-hmm. Plutarch. Uh, basically, he's the new games uh, coordinator, uh, and they, it was when they first dance. The ballroom. The ballroom. And the in the book, he shows her a watch that has a disappearing Mockingjay on it, and it's a clock. It's a watch, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. we know after seeing the movie figures into the plot big time. It was a hint. It was a it hint. Was a, it hint. was a hint. And it, you know, it was a hint. Huge. And <laughs> instead, they chose to go sinister they chose to make that scene but it's a big part of the book in Mm -hmm. which katniss is like she's got to think about this and going is he on my side why is he showing me this why would he show why would he show me this and you know and then later on it plays into oh my you know light dawns and they they excised that from the movie and they made it and i think they were sort of maybe going for the non-reader where they made Philip Seymour Hoffman a little bit more sinister because the dialogue they had and the way that he delivered it yeah. to me, mm-hmm. right? I mean, did it seem like it's... Yeah, it was, well, like, that whole... Actually, Phil was telling me about that too because I, we, he, had, he and I had the same issue with that. Uh, yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman, is, if he's trying to keep her alive... Right. Why is he... I, why is he doing all these things that he can't control? I mean... The, the, here's the, the thing. I don't, I don't know. You know, I didn't read the books, but for me right from the get-go, because of that scene, and, and uh, perhaps it's because I am a smart viewer. I don't know. Don't mean to put my... I'm going to switch hate mail for that. <laughs> well, I knew... You're a smart viewer. Right? I knew that Philip Seymour Hoffman was going to be a good guy, and that he was playing uh, Snow. Yeah. You know, uh, right. they had those three scenes, and I was like, okay, this this is too strategic on his part, and Snow's kind of going... And Snow's kind of calculating moves. him, too, and he doesn't... Uh, you know, something's n- not right, and I think uh, it's to Katniss's advantage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I this really bothered me. I think it's a huge symbol. Yeah, it gives away mm-hmm. like it was really a sign of help, and it makes all these other little things even flash more. I also think it takes away a little bit of the credit to um, of Katniss. Well, he, you know, it, in terms of a symbol, because uh, uh, in, in in the sense of this, right, Cadmus is supposed to be almost like the Dark Knight, where it, like even if she's killed, she's a symbol of hope and all these right. different things. And so, in order to convey that message, you know, I mean, we get that one great scene where she spins, remember, with the costume, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, there she is as the Mockingjay, you know. But you have to, you do have to convey that, and so that that is. Um, um, tough to hear that it was in the book, but it wasn't in here, yeah. especially when people are saying that it is so faithful from what right. I've heard to the book. And and it dis- yeah. again, going back, it discredits the symbolism of the Mockingjay. It's yet another, you know, we're leading up to, to the and final it, story, which is called Mockingjay. And yet the first two movies have sort of kind of like fluffed off the side. They brushed yeah. her aside wow. the wow. emblem on, oh, on right. the co- that, cover that, of this, the book. This, right. This yeah. 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 There's a reason that that was your that's, cover art. Like, but we did. I find see, that we also did see the symbol of Mockingjay when they're on the train. And it's on the mm. wall. And so it's. And we do see it on a piece here. of parchment. Yeah. Coming no, out I, 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 yeah. I get yeah, that. But the whole idea of the watch and the timepiece and then the. But yeah, that Yeah. It's it's you know. And, and again, to your point, because I was thinking this, too, at the, you know, at the end with Plutarch, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the movie, I was like going, you know, the way it's presented in the movie, it really looked like Plutarch was going out of his way to kill her. Yeah. Like he was doing everything like, oh, oh, well, we're here. Let's spin the thing around and let's right. see. the." And I was like going, wow, that that's sort of kind of crazy. And I think if you had some semblance of a they, they threw one throwaway line. Uh, when one of somebody came out of the bushes and they go and and Peter said 
wow, it's almost like that person sacrificed himself. There's a few. Or, you know. There's yeah. a few. There's a few little instances. That's why I, I didn't find that there were like enough, but I knew going in only because I read the book. But how do you let? Again, it's the small things, mm-hmm. and it could have been so easily done. You were already filming that scene, so right. I think they purposely left it out, for, and I and I think that was the new director's vision of it. And I I think if he would have pulled the watch out at that time, it would have been too obvious that Philip Seymour Hoffman's character was totally on her side. I think he wanted that to be, you know, the climax at the end, which mm-hmm. it was. It was a big cliffhanger. And for those who didn't see the book, who watched the movie with us. They didn't feel they were missing anything. They didn't read the book. They didn't yeah. know the watch. And it left that big climatic yeah, of ending course. of, so you're like, Who's oh, this? Yeah. yeah, I think that would have been the <clears throat> dead <throat> giveaway then that, oh, he's the good guy and for sure well, he's going to. Well, it depends on how you do it because yeah. I, I would have liked to have seen more to him because it, it just seems so out of the blue. Yeah, and, that, and I for me it was too it was too convenient too much and and this is my word for it it's too much of a cheat it was just too yeah. easy and, and I it, was, it was much more interesting to be layered. Yeah, I agree. And and again, like because I had said it too, I, I go perhaps it was a conscious decision mm-hmm. to make it more of a twist for the quote unquote non reader. Exactly, that's exactly what it and was. And I get that, but then to an extent that sort of kind of is a diss to the fans mm-hmm. and to the people. You know, when you're going into a movie, and maybe maybe the teenager, maybe they don't care so much. I don't know. I care. But, no, we all care. <laughs> you know. But the thing is, also, yes, if you've read the books, we know Plutarch is actually a good guy. Right. And when we first get introduced to him in the movie, he's wearing a regular outfit. You can already tell visually that he's not really part of the Capitol. He doesn't seem like he really belongs there. Sure. And the fact that he also volunteered shows mm-hmm. that, that he wanted to be in that position. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he. Okay. there were some subtleties. Like, he says that she inspired him. We do get that someone mm-hmm. sacrificed. We do get that they all want to be her ally. Random things like that. They are. It is put in throughout the movie. I just think that they, they should have added the watch. Yeah, Phil, what are your thoughts on, uh, on he, that? Or, his he, thoughts are we should move on yeah, to the story he trilogy. Wants to talk about <laughs> the trilogy. trilogy. Well, he wants no. to move on to You know, that. I mean, part of it, we're, you know, I'll tie this into that. Yeah. You know, with him... Uh, we get kind of three really good scenes, and Snow gets a f- um, few few good scenes minus him. But overall, in terms of the second movie, we spend a lot of time on Katniss, mm-hmm. you know. And, and in terms of building a trilogy, um, for me, it was interesting that we stuck that 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 was a choice because usually uh, you tend to kind of veer off. Now this could be because it's well, we're not talking really... specifically movie trilogies here, right? We're not, we're not talking about books. You're talking about how they do it in movies. Correct. Yeah. In okay, movies. Great. Now it could be a byproduct that this isn't a real trilogy. It's a, the books are a trilogy. The movies are <laughs> yeah. quadrilogy. Yeah, exactly. Quadrilogy. Yeah. yeah. What so, is your and, point? So, so, <laughs> no, my point is it's, this. I found it interesting that as a sequel, that we stuck that much to Katniss because yeah. normally at this point, again, I'm basing this. I've never. I, I don't know if you guys can name any quadrilogies because again, most of my things are trilogies. No. In a in a trilogy, the yeah. second uh, installment installment, we would have already known about the rebellion much more so True. than we do now. Yeah. True. You usually mm-hmm. get to know more about the world, the around outside it. world, and exactly. Because the the first one's really about this person, and then it right. becomes a bigger story. Mm-hmm. And that was interesting to me too, and and I, not in a good way because I didn't, I had not read the books, I don't know anything about the rebellion. I'm going, I want to know that. Why right. you're, t- you're not telling me? Because I really didn't even know what the world was like in the sectors. Is that my saying? The, well, districts. Districts, the districts. Thank you. Because I, I wanted. I was like, well, oh, well. well I didn't really get enough of what those were like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they don't yeah. they don't really, you know, to they, your point, they each one even when they were in district uh, 11, 11 it looked just like district 12 and it looked yeah. like they haven't really made too much of a distinct one, distinction mm-hmm. cinematically right. mm-hmm. to tell you when they do it in the books. In the books, mm-hmm. you know, like district 12 is coal mining, yeah. district 11 there's oh, like, so no, there's a there's difference one, to there's, all of them. There's right. one and line in the first in, or, movie. Uh-huh. There's like one line in the first movie and there's one in the second. The first one is when they're describing the costumes mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. each costume is supposed to represent what that oh, district, district knows, which is yeah. why Katniss goes in this whole girl on fire thing because mm-hmm. they were coal. coal. They've always been coal miners and now she's transformed that into mm. this girl on fire i i have the list district one is luxury two is masonry three is technology four is fishing which is where uh Finnick Finnick comes from, from and why and that's Max how is he won fish hook. yeah how he won um five is power six is transportation seven is lumber which is joanna also tree. why she has an axe yeah tree um 
Eight is textiles, nine is grain, ten is livestock, eleven is agriculture, and twelve is mining. Okay. Coal mines. So there so, you go. Yeah. You know, and also uh, And thirteen th- is nuclear energy. Yes. <laughs> in case you're wondering. Which is another thing because in the book they talk about <laughs> District thirteen in the middle of the movie and at in the movie they only talk about District thirteen for the first time at the end. Right. And we miss the entire footage bit of the movie. We yeah. have been had glimmers of right. District thirteen since I believe book one, mm-hmm. um, yeah. where we know there's another 13, and it's basically been portrayed as this 13th, the 13th district, which I believe was in charge of nuclear power, that got completely destroyed in the first rebellion. Okay. It's supposedly Obliterate. completely gone. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning of each reaping, they always show footage uh-huh. of what District 13 looks like, and it's like crumbled and burnt to the ground. And in Catching Fire, the book, we're, we understand that this footage is faked. Because supposedly there's a key bird symbolism that like <laughs> flies across the same exact instant of this oh, footage. Oh, wow, interesting. So we know that there's this 13 that's Got supposedly it. demolished, but something is being corrupted by the government. Yeah. And it's this huge clue that they leave out. It is, and right. this goes into our trilogy right. talking, right? Well, I mean, it does exactly. because, yeah. I mean, right. partly, you know, this is, more of, this is more about the genre, not necessarily about the trilogy, but it kind of ties in in the sense of when usually when there's games involved, and I understand this is not a game, you, you cut to, oh, here's the people at home watching, whatever it is. And so right. we get reaction shots. With this, you know, I, I, obviously thus far they've made a very conscious decision to not cut away mm-hmm. from what is happening. But, you know, like think of any race movie yeah. or stuff like Yo, that. Especially it, it, and they're thing. going against that genre convention, which is... Uh, I think it's, it's a difficult thing. It comes to the point that a lot of things that are important, they said through very short lines instead right. of through visions. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, like the view of the Capitol, we get a line from, I believe, Joanna saying that everyone loves your sister. And if anyone ever did anything to Prim, like the whole Capitol would have riots. But we don't see that no. love. We never got to see the love of the Capitol loving yeah. your sister. So it's not as it's not as believable. It's not, like it's if not they as show either. people like loving Prim or if they show people loving her and Peter, you're gonna believe it more. Mm-hmm. And that happens a lot throughout this film. And I think it does come it comes back to why they focus so much on Katniss mm-hmm. in this. Um I mean, Dimitri, we talked about earlier the difference between the first one and how they focused on the other tributes even. Sure. Oh yeah. I mean to me that was uh Yeah, and to your point, Phil, yeah, you're right. I mean, they didn't even focus the first one, they they did show uh, them going, getting audience reaction as mm-hmm. they're watching the games on TV. And you're right, this one it was non-existent. I honestly we didn't, didn't get a even know I, that going, it was I being guess, broadcast. I guess that yeah, right. I didn't for yeah. a second think that anybody could actually view these except for the game. Uh, yeah, cubers. they didn't they didn't so do I could, that. Well, I don't I didn't understand it at all. I'm going, yeah. why they're having these games that nobody mm-hmm. can watch. So what I don't because I thought it was in, in one one yeah. one sense or another to mollify and the they, masses and it's I, well yeah, I guess really. to your point they they didn't do a good job as to they actually were playing to the initiated and not so much the uninitiated so mm-hmm. to speak. So if you were coming in sort of kind of blindly, you didn't I mean. Yeah, they are being broadcast as mm-hmm. like a huge. Yeah, I just didn't get that yeah. any district. They didn't or, do or, that. Sorry, what's, one. what's it called again? District. district. Yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah, get yeah. any district. Was rooting for anybody. I didn't yeah. really get any sense of that. And in the first one, you also got a better sense of the tributes, and to the the players of the game. Mm-hmm. And in this one, to me, they just they were they were red meat. That yeah. that they were that was it. They were just targets. Mm-hmm. Like we didn't get to know any of them. And these sort of things bother me too. Um, they made it a point to focus on one of the tributes who filed her teeth down. And right. Elvira. Yeah. Elvira. And Elvira. And, 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 and then we don't see much. And, and and then, then, yeah, we yeah, don't see that. It doesn't it's like, track. okay, so why are you showing me this if this isn't going to pan out to something mm-hmm. later on? Like, though, again, those are those are and, small things that amount to big things, I think. And then and these are, this is the one point that I'm going to, like, try and find the rationalization mm-hmm. or, like, at least why I was able to like the movie and accept this uh-huh. is because they gave me something else in exchange that I ah. could cling on to. So while they did, I they did not focus on what you would say like the bad tributes or mm-hmm. the career pack as much. Like my reason for that was because they're so similar to the Cato and to our other careers from the I first agree. film yeah. that we didn't really need to see as mm-hmm. much. And also, you know, they are fitting four hundred pages into this two and a half hour sure, film. Yeah. And instead, they gave me other supporting characters that I really did like. Mm-hmm. Like I really did like. I I think more than Dimitri, I really liked um, Nuts and Bolts. I really liked Joanna. 
Um, I really Finnick. <laughs> Finnick. I liked Finnick. I liked Mags. Mags, and she didn't have a single line. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, like let me, let me these go, are the things me. that they gave me that I was able to be like, I do care about mm-hmm. these people enough. Mm-hmm. I care about the team that she's created, and they're not a team. They're Team Katniss. There's a difference. I mean, mm-hmm. you can see it in the like the gold emblems. Each each gold trinket really isn't about them being a unif- unified team. It's about Katniss being up here and them all being a team behind her. Mm-hmm. But she's not even aware. Yeah. No, and, no, yeah. The no, thing no, is, no, because but, the second movie, Katniss has more allies in this one than she did in the first game. Yeah, mm-hmm. but she doesn't know. And again, I'll say mm-hmm. from a story from a story standpoint, what's the basis for that? Why not let her in on the deal as to what's going on? So that yeah, they a had the certified... one line. They were afraid that they, they, that she would yeah. be found out in some fashion. Find I couldn't it. remember what the yeah. one line is, but as I, I was, and Phil, I think it's more because she makes rash decisions. <laughs> yeah. Phil, what were you going to say? What I, okay, I was going to ask this. We, you know, we'll obviously talk about the the third and fourth movie um, at length a little bit later. But in terms of that, why why not kind of put some of the third book in here so that way you trim from that and make it into a trilogy because I think, you know, for me, it's one of my biggest frustrations, but also one of the good things about this movie is as soon as it ends, I'm like, well, I want to see the rest. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 but you know, uh, again, I think, I think they could have done that and they could have answered some of these questions because again, unfortunately we are conditioned in these ways. It's like, where's, where's the rest? Where's the rest? And 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 to go, where's the baby? do that. The, the, yeah, yeah where's the... Catching fire ended exactly like that. Yeah, it did. Well, yeah, With yeah, Katniss ended. finding right. out there's no right. District 12 anymore. No, and the book ended that way, but I I'll, I'll want to go back to the tributes mm-hmm. in one way, shape, or form. It, it beca- well, because if you're killing off, like, I never got... There was... Okay, you say nuts and bolts. Do you remember who nuts and bolts were? No. B. Okay. Do you remember you who Beanie was? No. Okay. It's, I mean, I it was Amanda Plummer. Yeah. yeah. I just don't it was, remember his name. It was, it was uh, Amanda Plummer's character. Not, now I do. And, <laughs> it took um, me a second. Right. Yeah. And, um, uh, Hickory, I forget. Dickory, Doc, I forgot. Dick 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 okay. Okay. Two guys. Two now, people. In, in, in the book, mm-hmm. when when she dies, TikTok mm-hmm. woman, I mean, Stabbed. that was, it was <laughs> sad. It was, in, in this movie, Outside of like Katniss and stuff, anybody who got killed, I could have cared less about because mm-hmm. I didn't know anything really about them, mm-hmm. and I wasn't, I didn't get to know nuts and bolts like I did. There wasn't and that bond. I don't there. think that detracted. It's I don't bolts. think that detracted bolts. from the movie at all. I happen to disagree, and I agree yeah. with Sarah. I think in exchange, they gave us other things that that made it enjoyable to watch. I don't think we needed to know all the backstory between every tribute. I think. Mm-hmm. The story that we got of each of them was enough to make the movie successful. You got to know a bit of them. Mags, like you said, didn't speak at all, but yet you grew to love her in a short period of time. But did you really love I Amanda really, Plummer? No, I yeah, mean it I was more I emotional it, when Mags, when Mags, and, and she did it in a in a you know she sacrificed herself. Way, but yeah. the right. thing is, uh, if you read the yeah. book, Mags was a really important person to Finnick, and yeah, we saw that Finnick was really attached to her. Sure, and yeah. we understood why he felt for Mags right. when she died. And the thing is, but nuts and bolts, they played their part. N- mm-hmm. Nuts gave the exposition. It's the arena is a clock. She, sure, and that was necessary for everyone to learn. All right, that was done. So yes, she died. She had really nothing See, else to and add I to could, it. And I could, I could tell you a lot about each of. The, I feel like I could mm-hmm. talk about each of those characters a lot. I could give you some of their story. You have a relationship between nuts and bolts. You have how they've pl- uh, helped the capital. How they've been used in the other ways. How he went from being a victor to creating some of this technology. You have this. I'm uh, Phil's trying to talk to me about something, but <laughs> I'm gonna keep, no, going. keep going. And then Finnick. Finnick, right. you got glimmers of his home life. You got glimmers of why he's nice. But I'm glad they didn't go completely into his love story. They didn't give you every detail because I don't think you really need to know it. Yeah, and they I, gave I, it foreshadowing, enough, too. Yeah, yeah, it was enough No, they gave it foreshadowing, but secrets. if you're, if you're secrets. killing... Secrets foreshadowing. Exactly. I felt like, okay, I'm going to go back to Hunger Games for a second. The character of Rue. Mm-hmm. When mm-hmm. Rue dies, that means something. Mm-hmm. It was very heartfelt... And you mm-hmm. understand why. And I think the strength of the books to me, at least the first two, the, what the major strength is and what, what Suzanne Collins nailed in this war allegory, and let's not forget that it is a allegory about war, that there was consequence for violence. Mm-hmm. Consequence mm-hmm. for violence. Whenever anybody got killed, there was a consequence. Violence was not done cheaply. 
And there was something, somebody had to bear something. Katniss had to bear something for whatever she had to do to survive. And I think that gets sort of lost in this movie where it didn't so much get lost in the first one. There wasn't so much consequence for violence because I didn't know any of these tributes like they were described in the book. And I get that you can't do exposition on every single character, but there wasn't the consequence for violence. When somebody died, they just died. They were gone. Canon. See you later. Well, Let's move the plot I along. I think Cam makes but a great point. But they did give you... Okay. That what you say, they hardly do any exposition with Mags. Get that Next. Next. Hook. But you, you, do, and, and because of what Marissa said, because Finnick cares for her so much, and the fact that she doesn't sure. say anything, and, and uh, for many reasons, you, you do care. And I think they could have done a little bit more. I'm not saying they need to hold know the whole backstory, but if mm -hmm. if uh, uh, nuts was that important, that that would have been fun to 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 just juice that a little bit because taking as much time as they did with Mags, they just I don't think they wrote that one as clearly. No. Okay, well, okay, so maybe I could see that with that. Ah, I'm going to skip to this actually. Right, Morphling. Ahead. Morphling that passed away <laughs> in, and they sacrifice her and she's basically in the water. They're, Peta and right. Katniss are holding her telling her to look at the sky. Beautiful. You shot. see her for one minute in this film and I thought that they did give her the acknowledgement that they didn't even know her. They didn't know her name but they still thought she deserved some sense of beauty and didn't deserve this death. Like I thought they did capture things like that. So. Well, for me the part that was missing and maybe this is because they chose and I don't know if, is this in the book that she doesn't know uh, Kat does, does not know what's happening that she doesn't know that people are sacrificing themselves she does. she's right. not she aware does. of it. She, because right. in the book Katniss is led to believe that people are sacrificing themselves to save PETA, not to save oh, her. Okay. Well, for me, the part that was missing is how it affected our main character. I, I didn't see that it was affecting her. If I had seen how uh, Nuts' death it was affected affects her, her. You see her more when like the old man dies and she in the beginning in District uh, 11. She's uh, more affected there. That, no, I get that part, mm -hmm. but I'm saying I, I think they missed an opportunity because it's your main character. I want to know how is this affecting her. I mean, we, we see that she has these uh, um, memories, these um, flashes mm -hmm. of what uh, she's thinking about from what happened in the, mm -hmm. I assume, the first Hunger Games. Right. But we, I get no indication of how she feels about any of what's going on in front of her except the fact yeah. that she's not sure who to trust. Right. But I don't know how she feels about Nuts dying. I, I don't know how she feels about any of that. Yeah. And it, for me, that's a misstep. If it's your main character and I don't know where she is emotionally or what she's thinking or feeling, I think you, you, you missed something. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you. And I think that was one of my one of my problems or issues going into this one is that if she wasn't feeling anything, it's hard for me to feel something like later on and not knowing the tributes as we did in the first one mm -hmm. so much, you know, and going into the trilogy. I mean, Phil, were we going to talk about, you know, you're right. It's not a traditional trilogy. It's a quadrilogy. And we're going into Mockingjay's parts one and two. Were you, uh, is that where you wanted to go? No, we want to go to the characters. Here's the characters? my question. <laughs> Ahead, Does the book tell me where all her extra arrows come from? <laughs> I just kind of okay, wondering. actually, the the book at, at the yeah, very yeah. beginning of the remember. game, yeah. okay. at the very beginning of the game, Katniss actually grabs two bows, yes. you know, like in two qu uh, quivers full of arrows. Yes. Throughout the movie, it only looks like she only grabbed one. And then when they go back to the cornucopia and they spin it all around, mm -hmm. she sh um, they say the line, "Let's get what we need and get out of here." So right. we're led to believe that she grabbed another. Quivers. Yeah, she has a couple instances weapons. where she has yeah, zero, and then yeah. she has six. Get every gun and every shoot them up movies. And how they have so many bullets? Yeah, yeah. And that's fine. Because and they also, in the book, she grabs yeah. two, and she actually gives one. I knew two that there was something well. there, and I couldn't remember what it was. But all they yeah. had to do once is just have her pick, take an arrow out of something, yeah. and then they, okay, we know yeah. she's collecting arrows. They, like they, uh, they like in Walking Dead, exactly. Yeah, but the other thing that they don't show in the movie is in the books they get a hell of a lot more parachutes. You know, mm -hmm. the other oh, thing okay. that they don't explain so much, too, is that the um, our tributes are sponsored by their popularity, by, by the rich people, and they oh. send them things that could mm -hmm. potentially I help them through the games. They don't that. really... That's why they got the spigot. No, I got the, that yeah. I, got, but I didn't think that... I, didn't, I thought that was just something that Hamish did. I didn't know that yeah. everybody got those Hamish things. Hamish gets yeah. money Hamish. from people, yeah. and then... See, I, is and sometimes they send yeah. their own. And in this film, we only saw one them get... The spy one, the spy one thing. They're, yeah. And the, in the book, they got loaves and they actually yeah. got food, which got was food. another yeah. missing plot point to... Yeah. Uh, it, right. it was sent in code. Well, like one day, they sent three loaves yeah. to indicate oh, the third day that they were going to plan on getting out. And then the second time they sent more loaves was 
they sent 24 of them to indicate right. the hour which time they, they were going to do it. Mm -hmm. So they missed that as well. Right. Got it. Right. And I just I wanted to touch real quick on mm -hmm. Katniss's feeling where you said you can identify mm -hmm. with her. She, she shows no emotion. They say that kind of throughout the film is that she's not really a likable girl. You can't read her. But I think that she's got this wall up. All she can think about is to survive. I mean, the conditions that I she's raised in, then going in. It's hard for her to show any kind of emotion because everything is moving so quickly, and they're just trying to. I, I no, feel like I every time they gave Jennifer Lawrence the the camera, like the ability to mm -hmm. show, mm -hmm. she did it. She acted. Yeah, I, I, it I, I, just I wasn't I the agree. opportunities yeah, given I to agree. show the reactions. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. I don't think any of us are saying anything mm -hmm. about like. She wasn't an emo emotionally invested mm -hmm. in this. She yeah. obviously was. It was we were just not getting them at certain points but, when we needed yeah. it. Yeah, mine wasn't. It wasn't specifically towards her or her mm -hmm. acting or anything like that. I I just think they missed the opportunities to do that. And mm -hmm. and I'm not saying. And again, I'm not saying you need a whole backstory or sure. scenes of it. Mm -hmm. I need moments here and there to let me know where she is. And I agree that it's very difficult for a character like that who has her walls up. But all along, we could see her conflict. Yeah, with what's she, she going to do with her wonderful. boyfriend? What's right. she going to do with Peter? Mm -hmm. And and those moments. They were yep. they were willing to show right. Well, yeah. when Gail chose says, not to show me, it in other ones, and she couldn't. She's like, I can't even deal with that right now. Mm -hmm. I right. think she didn't want her heart to be anywhere because mm -hmm. she didn't know what was yeah. going to happen. But but they they were they allowed you those opportunities to see those conflicts and certain, and, and those inner uh, inner inner turmoil. But in certain ones, they didn't. And I just think those are missed opportunities when you're not allowing me to show the conflict that your main character is going through. You, I think you miss an opportunity. Yeah. And, and but they did. The really wasn't. It. It was just and, uh, yeah. I know we mm -hmm. have been before, but one thing too that was really completely forgot about is this whole thing started because she wanted to protect her sister right mm -hmm. this yeah, whole she and, and in her place and in this movie mm -hmm. you don't get i, I didn't you she don't get any of that at all yeah oh. this whole yeah. thing started to protect her sister oh, and prim okay. plays such a small part in yeah this. it was like uh, yeah uh, and uh, but it's all well, speaking of prim then the small characters let's talk yeah. about the acting let's start with sure. the characters acting, the, the acting, secondary acting. characters first like prim for instance and the ones that just have uh, you know, a scene or two because you were talking about not like nuts and bolts those characters as, as much as they or effie or any or, or, any Cena or any because of them that honestly i feel like so many people love so many fans mm -hmm. love these supporting characters yeah but i have to be like good job i mean Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna talk about Effie for a second. Sure. Um, Elizabeth Banks, you know, first first Hunger Games film, I was kind of like, okay, this is a lot to take in. This movie, I think, did so well for her. I think she did a wonderful job. I do also want to hand it to her. I was reading an article where Elizabeth Banks was talking about, she's a big fan of the books. Mm -hmm. So she's been mm -hmm. so happy to be part of this. And she gets a lot of room with Effie to um, improvise mm. i guess and add in and one of the small touches that she had just for a love of the fans and a love of the books is she puts in that the library cabinets were all mahogany <laughs> which is a and, and she, it was a tie into the first film where katniss stabs a table mm -hmm. out of like anger and she's like that's mahogany so she brought it back and she specifically mm -hmm. on that take was like you keep that in the fans are gonna love it and they have and that's being a smart actor and being mm -hmm. very Aware of your character, aware of your audience, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. I'll, I'll say of Elizabeth Banks, like I didn't mm -hmm. really like the mm -hmm. portrayal so much again in the first movie. I think Elizabeth Banks is a very talented. I think she's a she's a beautiful actress. I think in this movie, she was actually given the opportunity uh, to show her humanity, mm -hmm. uh, especially under yeah. all that makeup, all that gaudy mm -hmm. costuming and jewelry. She she was able to emote through that mm -hmm. because she actually showed like humanity mm -hmm. when, you know, especially when she's picking up the tribute thing. And mm -hmm. of course, it's, you know, Katniss is the only female. So mm -hmm. it's one. And, you know, that was a good scene for me. I, I really liked her. Mm -hmm. um, I personally would like to talk about uh, only because I have some. some on, uh, I was going to say oh. something about uh, Effie sure. that yeah. I loved her character growth in this movie because yeah. she's the person who like gets all the, you know, Katniss and Peeta. Mm -hmm. She she tries to keep them positive, even mm -hmm. though they know they're probably going to their death. She's the one that, like, really uh, makes everyone happy in every yeah. situation that they're in. And the thing about the second book, they don't really touch upon uh, Katniss's makeup and wardrobe team mm -hmm. because... They're the ones like Octavia and Flavius. Those are the characters. We saw a little bit of them in this movie. They're the ones who actually get emotional when yeah. they say goodbye to Katniss. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really Effie. But they, because we didn't touch upon those two side characters, mm -hmm. they gave that 
moment to Effie. And people she, love it. And that was a good yes, choice. And yeah. I didn't mind that because no, we saw either. Effie, she's the more nurturing mother, like mm-hmm. surrogate mother to, to them. And she's the one, even though she's trying to keep happy, she she still feels bad that Katniss and Peeta still have to go through this It was again. a good yeah. direction that they took with No, I, yeah. I, I agree Focus. 100%. And again, you... you one you, of those it, moments where they put something in. Right. Yeah, but I, I, I didn't mind. Yeah. And, you know, you had a good actress to pull it off. I think she's a very underappreciated actress. I mean, she can do drama. She can do comedy. She's very funny. Um, and like I said, in this movie, I liked her better in this movie than I did in Hunger Games too. There so. we go. And you, I think, wanted to bring up Joanna. Yeah, I mean, uh, Joanna Mason to me was a uh, is a needed character. This is the 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 character played by Jenna Malone, mm-hmm. and um, to me, that character had the standout one of the standout scenes in the entire movie because. She does and says something that we as audience members, maybe people in, in, in Panem or whatever. I mean, she's the one that gets up on stage and says, I already fought for you. I won. You promised me I'd never get back into these games again. I'm supposed to be living the li- lap of luxury. Fuck you, Capital. And I, like to me, I was like, oh, my God, somebody finally, a character is saying what they feel. Mm. Uh, to me, that was a breath of fresh air. And Jenna Malone is someone... I'm wearing, you'll notice, a contact. I'm not wearing M- Mockingjay. Mm-hmm. Oh. I'm wearing this in honor of Jenna Malone because That's I worked played. on Contact. Mm-hmm. And Jenna Malone, this is one of her first movies. And I actually got to know, I got to know the girl Jenna Malone um, somewhat. And I, and I can tell you, she was a very sweet, uh, she was a kind-hearted person. She had a great head on her shoulders. Her, She was smarter than her years would lead you to believe about her and we had conversations about thrill rides and jurassic park the ride and she's turned into a really fine actress throughout her career she was just recently in one of your favorites cammy she was in the hatfields and mccoys and she was fantastic in that she was in it well it's a guilty pleasure for me and i and i preface guilty pleasure by being it it ain't a good movie but for some reason i don't mind watching it she was in the sucker punch um, <laughs> yeah, I watched it, but 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 she was really good and strong, and 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 I would say that she may have even gotten this job partly. They may have took her into audition um, because of her performance in Sucker Punch. But actually, I heard when she came into audition, and they had auditioned a ton of girls for Joanna. Apparently, she came in in character. She had red eyes. And she came in, and, and Frances Lawrence, as soon as she walked in, she came in really angry. And Frances Lawrence said, I was intimidated by her. She got the role. And I'm like, that's good fantastic. Yeah. And, good, and good for her. And I just want, you know, she if she ever watches up. this, Jenna, yeah. good job. You're, you're a fine, say, talented. Yeah, again, I don't know anything about the one before, but I thought she was the standout performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was great. You know, I don't remember anybody but her. And when she came on screen, she was like, oh, okay, she's here. <laughs> she was present the entire time. Yeah. She had wonderful scenes mm, yeah. on top of each other. Yeah, like yeah. even moments when you just saw her being frustrated mm-hmm. or angry. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, mm-hmm. wonderful moments. Um, actually, I think we did get one of the one of her strongest glimpses for me was when she was wielding her axe. Yeah. In the training field, she didn't say anything, and she just like they're all <laughs> staring Katniss down, mm-hmm. like basically one by one, and she's just like really going at just the air, and yeah. I was just like that. There was nothing holding her back. It wasn't like oh, swing your axe, and we'll give you a minute. It was like. I'm going to swing this yeah. axe as hard as I can, as many times as I can, until someone makes me stop. <laughs> yeah. Like, it was a great moment. One of also my favorite scenes in general of the movie was in that training yeah. session. It also raises some questions. Am I allowed to? I'm going to go into this. Whole okay, thing. here we go. This All is right. one of my favorite scenes, mostly because we do got we got to see Katniss in kind of her full potential if she really embraced what the capital wanted her to do. Mm -hmm. Um, She goes into the archery sector to show mags, and I believe she kills about nine people within, what, 15 seconds? Mm -hmm. I think it's just... the computer-generated one. The The holodeck. Yes, the hologram. But she she actually shoots birds, not people. But, but they changed the it, and I, yeah. I this is one of the changes I did like. Yeah, I, did I thought it was a very interesting just visual interpretation because it does give you the idea that if Katniss went into this arena mm-hmm. really wielding a bow the way she can, she could destroy everyone mm-hmm. within a matter of seconds. If she became a tool of the capital and really gave over to what they wanted and was just willing to shoot everything, she she would win. She would win that way too. Sure. Um, and especially like even the 
people that they did show in holograms, they wielded very similar weapons to the peop- uh, to her featured like opponents. Like we did see someone with the scepter, the mm-hmm. all sorts of things. So I just really liked that they sh- showed her physical capability and what she's really up against. Like she's not this weak person. She can shoot, she can hunt, mm-hmm. she deserves these people to follow her because she can be very dangerous. Mm-hmm. And it's, I mean, I can't go into the third book, yeah. but it's an interesting the third contrast book, yeah. to what we get in yeah. the beginning. Well, uh, and, and so the there's some, some bit of a controversy right here in our little panel about the other actors and the characters that they portray. And shall we talk about uh, Stanley Tucci? And yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get right into Kimmy, it. Kimmy, how, <laughs> how did you like that before? I loved him. I, uh-huh. I loved Stanley Tucci. I loved, I loved his character. Mm-hmm. I thought he added a big presence on stage. He was funny. I thought he was entertaining. Um, again, you're going into, a ba- I mean, Hunger Games. Mm-hmm. It's bad. It's sad. It, you know, mm-hmm. people are dying. And yet he just brought a different element. Um, he, he was kind of fun and entertaining to watch, I thought. And and th- I'm going to jump on that because... Again, I don't, I don't, didn't come in this knowing anything other than I just looked at him and the veneer that he had on. Mm-hmm. I go, he perfectly represents what I think yeah. is the capital, which is this. They're all about the aesthetic and the yeah. presence rather than any substance underneath it. So it worked for me. Right. The but, thing is about Caesar Flickerman. He, his job is to make the Hunger Games presentation entertaining right. and enjoyable to watch. And then when it comes to the point where he's interviewing all the tributes on stage, and then they're all like kind of being defiant and going against the capital a little bit <laughs> and, and he's calling it it's like cut it out it, yeah, and cut, he cut. it <laughs> even shows his character even though he's the entertainment in the face of the hunger games mm-hmm. he he's even concerned when he realizes mm-hmm. that they're starting a little even the capital the the tributes are starting a little bit of an uprise mm-hmm. so you see just a, that change of character mm-hmm. right Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll um, go last. <laughs> last. <laughs> I mean, I'll go then. How about okay, this? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Only because I, you know, uh, speaking to Marissa's point, I really like that uh, moment at the end where he's like, "All right, just cut this broadcast." Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I've I, I've had enough of this. This is what you guys send me out to do. Like, did you guys? Did you seriously not think mm-hmm. that these people would be just complete a holes mm-hmm. because they don't want to do this, and I'm supposed to smile for this? Yeah, mm-hmm. I've had enough. Yeah, and I love that moment from him, and I thought he played it really, really well because up until that point, he was all like. Oh, hey, mm-hmm. good for you. Exactly. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's fun. His character to me is is entertaining. I think he does represent the capital well, but I do under think we understand that he is smart. He is fake and he is cheery and he has that laugh that you're like, "Oh my goodness." <laughs> but at the same time, he will twist things in the in the way that the capital wants him to. Mm-hmm. For instance, when um Katniss talks about her wedding dress being because of President Snow or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, he takes her line and just goes, "Oh yes, but we can we can fix anything you say because he's always right." Mm-hmm. Just how he subtly will like change things mm-hmm. to be camera appropriate to do his job. Yeah, I mean, to do his job it, as he the as state well as owner. working for survival, just like everybody mm-hmm. else, because he exactly. knows if he doesn't do his job. He and yeah. I like that they note that mm-hmm. and yeah. put a nod to it. I don't know. To me, that 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 <laughs> character there was there was too much of him. He was to, because to me there was too much insincerity like i didn't catch much sincerity and, and not so much as i did in the book and he was just so over the top and a lot of people were likening him to to uh, ryan seacrest mm-hmm. and stuff and i i'm sorry i just he to me he was like a he was as if merv griffin and rona barrett came into mm-hmm. one and there was like that is ryan uh, seacrest it was, <laughs> I, it, but it was just to me i, I he was one of the reasons why I couldn't wait to get mm-hmm. into the arena. Oh, I was, okay. I guess, there was too much time for me in the capital. Mm-hmm. I wanted. We know. We know where we're headed. Let's let's hurry up and get there already. And I don't know. He just. I, I like Stanley Tucci as an yeah. actor. I, I, think I think he's, he's a fantastic yeah. actor. I think, for, I think for me, well, I for what know, he had to do me. in terms of acting and what he's what the character served for the piece, because to me, he was everything. He was the horrible aesthetic and how mm-hmm. ridiculous that was, and underneath. He knows he's just doing, he has to do what he has to do and right. so he doesn't get killed or fired or whatever. And he's a very interesting, <laughs> I mean, he's a very interesting contrast to Effie and to President Snow yeah. because there are these di- three different perspectives. They have also got like these commonalities. Like mm-hmm. you definitely get the look between like yeah. Effie and Caesar, like 
they're the same look mm -hmm. but they both have like their struggles yeah. caesar's it's that balance of i don't want to be another seneca crane and mm -hmm. i have to do my job and effie's is oh i'm starting to actually love these people exactly, that i yeah. thought were she actually in had a, a real little moment with them exactly and you do get to see how people in the capital kind of have the other mm -hmm. things they're battling with mm -hmm. so i really like both of their characters i also but, think it added a little lightheartedness yeah, i mean that's when kind of, of a little bit of comedy mm -hmm. came in it was it was fun to watch. And I think deep down he started rooting for Katniss as well. I think that he really liked her. Nobody could show that because, yes, they would be mm -hmm. killed. Mm -hmm. But I think he started really liking her and, and waiting to see what she was going to come out with. It was very exciting. And I thought it was kind of a little bit of a, you mm -hmm. know, fun having him in there. Well, he does say the line when all the tributes are coming mm -hmm. out to the capital that my favorites. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I think he meant that, 12. though. I, I yeah. think he was really growing yes. to like him. Oh, and on that note, she would have been my favorite, too. She That was a beautiful, beautiful dress, beautiful that scene. Awesome. Be great yeah. timpani So drums. much better than... Like, but the scene, that scene played... that. The chariot scene mm -hmm. and the twirling scene in this movie played much better in this movie than in, in Hunger Games. Did in the first one. Um, yes. You know, the first one, those scenes look, I'm going to, they look cheap. Like mm -hmm. the, the, the fire effect didn't look good at all. Obviously, they had more money for this one yeah. because they made it look better. better. And when she it's twirled, called catching fire for crying. Yeah. yeah. Better yeah. get that right. And, and when she twirled, like, in, you know, on stage, that scene to me, it was mm -hmm. a really, really good scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought they did her that, that part very well. Any other standouts in the acting or characters that you liked or anything that you want to add? Because, you know, obviously... Scene-wise, I thought that uh, Cena's final... Well, who knows if it's final scene or not. Um, his torture scene as she's about to go up the tube mm -hmm. um, into the arena and they bash his face into that glass. Oh, yeah. I thought was done really well. Mm -hmm. um, her reactions to it, too. Just like the, yeah. the fact that the fact that they made her... Cr or that she crouched yeah. mm -hmm. as she was going up and she wasn't just staring that it was really her trying to get mm -hmm. back down into that corner to him really loved that really loved um district 11 just the actors that we don't even really get to know the mom or his family um the old man who gets shot i was felt very emotionally connected to them and i thought that they did a really good job yeah like, that, that's an indication of how they actually showed you what mm -hmm. how it was having an effect mm -hmm. on cat i mean sure. clearly yeah, so anyway, mm -hmm. it was and it was effective because now mm -hmm. for some reason now I really cared more about the mm -hmm. that character than before. Yeah, and also that the character, the peacemaker thread, um, whipping Gail at um, during District Twelve when all the peacemakers mm. come yeah. and barge into mm -hmm. their their town. But, that seems um, a little he adjusted. Was, but yeah, he was scary. I from what I saw, he was very intimidating. He showed everyone his place and his power sure. um, in a matter of like two minutes. Yeah, no, and he yelled loud. Uh, yeah. You know, talking about characters, you know. Um, he carried uh, a big whip. Um, um, <laughs> he did. Uh, comfortable enough in my manhood to say, you know, I liked actually the character of Finnick O'Dare played by Sam Claflin. I thought, Loved it. I actually thought as far as like, the, he had more of a presence than either Peter and or Gail uh, in this movie, I thought he was really good at what you know he had to portray, mm -hmm. and and then you know how, in the end, how he comes back, you know how how we see him at the very end of the movie. Mm -hmm. But I thought that the guy that played him was you know he was really good. Yeah, and he, he did have a very, very strong, strong presence. presence. Yeah. Very strong. Very strong yeah. presence. I would say also that he. He definitely outweighed Peter for me. Absolutely. Um, and I thought he walked the line, too, because I wasn't sure. Is he on or not? Yeah. yeah. I thought he yeah. really walked the line yeah. very yeah. well. Yeah, he did a good job. Like, Peter's moments, the, when I'm thinking about it, it's like the only really moments I'm really hold on to from PETA is probably when he like drops the cards um, mm -hmm. in his speech and he yeah. goes out and he really gives a thing. That, that was, was a good moment. That was his only really good yeah. moment. Yeah. But and it's also as soon as Finnick comes kind of onto the yeah. screen that yeah. like, we kind of lose PETA. Yeah. And I think I, another no. good moment with PETA is when he's telling Katniss that she has a family back home and mm -hmm. that he cares about his family too and their well-being. So I think but that was another stand. But he doesn't have anybody to fight for. <laughs> yeah. 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 Two minutes but later. That was like <laughs> another standalone. Uh, right, well, I did. I, I will say this about the gentleman who played Peta is that in this movie, he wasn't as. I didn't think he was as sappy. I thought they had a good conversation at the mm -hmm. at the caboose of the train there, mm -hmm. and I like that he goes, "I know nothing about you," and we're supposed to be in love and. Like, what's your favorite color? And I love the line. She goes, oh, now you're getting, that's too much. And, but I like that dialogue. Mm -hmm. And 
again, that character, uh, I forget his actor's name. I Josh Hutchinson. Josh Hutchinson. I thought he was better again in this movie. I thought everybody was better in this movie than they were in the first one. But you're right. Sam Claflin had such a presence yeah. that I think it overshadowed. And Gail is in the movie for such a short time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, but all the girls love Gail. Of course. Yeah. Just want you to know. Everybody's yeah. like, oh, they love him. And they I want Katniss, why, too. Yeah. But he, he, yeah, he's on why. there very, very hmm. short, but they it's tend to love question. Gail a little bit right. more than <laughs> Peta. <laughs> but all right. Well, we, so do we let's talk Jennifer Lawrence then? Jennifer yeah. Lawrence. How do we like? Oh, my goodness. I thought she did a wonderful job. I think it goes to show that everyone thinks she's doing a wonderful job because literally. <laughs> You can't get enough Jennifer Lawrence. She's got mm. like 80,000 movies going on mm. right now coming mm. up. It's like she's you the go. Girl. She's the gal right now. Mm-hmm. And full of charisma. And I think that she really throws herself into her work. And I didn't, I'm trying to think if there was like any moment in this movie that she missed for me. And I felt like she really took hold of like every opportunity they gave her. Mm-hmm. She, she, she went for it. Um, I just feel like she, really you can see the struggle that she goes through i think that you do get a dynamic that she's torn in all these different directions and doesn't really know what's going on and um i believe her i believe her when she says like she doesn't want to be the one that everyone's looking at i believe her when she says she when she really does want to just get out of there to the fact that when she has to just her screams are mm-hmm. so real and she has a scream like a bunch of times in this film we see her react to people dying we see her reacting to the the um, jabber jays when they're like mm-hmm. basically throwing those voices in the air like i thought she did a really believable job yeah yeah i mean i think we are looking at you know today's you know she's a she's a great actress and i will say that going into hunger games the first one i really thought that she was slightly miscast because i felt that she was a little bit too old, too old to play yeah. the character one of the things about the book about the character of katniss everdeen is she's not a She's not a brawny girl by any means. She hunts. She's able to do all these things, but she is sort of kind of unassuming. And that she uses as an asset mm-hmm. because people don't look you at her. She's a advantage. small 16-year-old. She just happens to know how to wield a bow and arrow really well. So I thought going Jennifer Lawrence, you're a little bit older than you should be. Um, and, you know, then seeing some other performances that Jennifer Lawrence does, I mean, she makes it very easy to forget that she's something like 23 mm-hmm. No, she's my, she's my age. She? I think yeah. she's, no, she's 23. 23. I think she's 23. I'm, I'm older than she is. Right, yeah. and that to me shows, like, when she can be in a, in a Hunger Games kind of a movie and then do a Silver Linings playbook and, you now know, the upcoming to, uh, American hustle. Uh, hustle. But she's supposedly stealing she, the scenes in, so everybody look out. Yeah, her. and she plays much better she's able to play much beyond her years and you're able to buy it because she's a very good actress. I thought in Catching Fire, I thought again, okay, I saw her in the first movie. I buy her as Katniss Everdeen. And I think as an actress, yeah, she's, she's just, yeah, I think she's fantastic and she's going to continue to grow as an actress. She's, she has a gift. Speaking of uh, Silver Linings, yeah. Uh, yeah, I learned this about her from kind of the commentary on that where you know, she goes into a scene. She doesn't really read the script too much. She kind of reads it once. Maybe we'll read it a little bit beforehand. But she she kind of wants to keep it natural. And the fact that she can memorize all of her lines oh. and hit it specifically, especially for a David O. Russell film in that case, uh, I th- I think is outstanding and and uh, such a. But you know, don't be confused because she obviously knows the craft. Too many people think like. You know, if you hear that of like, oh, well, I can wing it too. No, she knows the craft enough and she knows what she needs to do. And that's her technique rather than like her yeah. quote unquote winging it. Yeah, yeah I agree. Nice mm-hmm. insight. I don't know where you got that, but good stuff. That's good stuff. Yeah, yeah no, she's a, I think she's definitely one of our finest actresses mm-hmm. out there today. Absolutely. She She's the it girl, it girl yeah. r- right mm-hmm. now. And I think she she's a good, strong person at um herself because i think if we did go the younger route maybe with like uh what was it with Haley steinfeld you know if mm-hmm. you went with like a younger actor do you think they would have had the um strength to keep doing all these movies and yeah no i mean if i had always thought because you know i always love uh hit girl uh chloe moritz mm-hmm. um 
I think that she definitely could have carried it off. Now, going into Catching Fire, I'm fine with Jennifer Lawrence. I've got no, I mean, she's she's great. But, you know, I always go to, if you're doing a, a saga, if you're doing a franchise like this, to me, the best casting in the world for this sort of thing was what Christopher Columbus did, or what Chris Columbus did for Harry Potter. Mm. I mean, Getting he picked unknown. those, they, they picked unknowns, they picked them young. I mean, so that we actually, as an audience, we grew up with them. Mm -hmm. So even though we get to the end where they're uh, older than the characters they're supposed to be, mm -hmm. that's okay. But they picked them so young and they became so great at their craft that, you know, to this day, I still think that what they did with Harry Potter goes understated. I think if you go younger because you're filming multiple movies, you know, Jennifer Lawrence is going to grow. She's, she's not going to look like a 17-year-old. You know, but I think that she's a good enough as a, of an actress where she'll carry it off, you know, and and make it work. Speaking, of, you know, uh, Sarah talked about this, but I think um, it deserves to be highlighted just one more time in terms of her as a strong character and and, and believability in terms of her. You know, it's that scene where she is um, training with the arrows, yeah, and it's a great combination of her um, having physical um, awareness of how to shoot this. And then obviously it helps, you know, the, there was, it's a combination of her and CGI, but you really believe her that she is strong in this. And then on the flip side of, you know, it, it's, it's Snow constantly keeps bringing up of, well, all she really is good at is a bow and arrow, but she doesn't really want this. And, it, and that comes across really well. And mm -hmm. I, I buy that from her. Like she's thrown into this and that's what I love and about they, her performance. And she also lets alongside all of this and all the drama and all the heartache that goes with her she does lend herself to comedy as well throughout the film like she lets she lets the other characters kind of make fun of her like you constantly get the pointings at like this one's the problem and she <laughs> like just lets it happen she doesn't force i mean you get the scene in jenna malone um we're in the uh, in the elevator and her face is so characterized like it's yeah, like yeah. literally but she's just like i'm not moving I'm not flinching. I'm not smiling. I don't care what, if who's <laughs> laughing at me. Like, she does that as well. And she yeah. does, they do it comedy out of her throughout this film. Mm. And I think that's impressive. And I think mm. without a strong actress, there was that great scene between Katniss and President Snow. And without a strong, you know, it was mm. a scene where he comes to her house. Right, right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she confronts President Snow. Yeah. Without a strong actress, that scene doesn't really work because I really thought that both Donald Sutherland and she worked off of each other so well, but she had this, again, she's supposed to be a 17 year old girl, mm -hmm. but when you have it, a 17 year old girl in the hands of a Jennifer Lawrence, mm -hmm. she really plays it to the maturity level that she can stand up to a Donald Sutherland or to a president snow and yet still look vulnerable. And that scene, I think her vulnerability is key. And uh, without a strong actress, that scene would not have worked the way that it did, I think. And also another vulnerability to Katniss is that she cares too much about the other people. When we see PETA getting hit by the force field, she she immediately starts crying and she's worried about his well-being. And uh, the, the lady at the District 12 when the peacemakers come in, she she's helping her like mm -hmm. help clean her eye and stuff so she she cares about other people too much that's also her weakness and as we see in mm -hmm. book three that like the capital uses that against her and one thing i like is that oftentimes like especially in that scene where she is caring for pita i don't get a sense sometimes when you see sometimes when you see actresses cry or like wail or scream you can still sense that they're trying to look pretty <laughs> um, <laughs> like i they don't cry want the big ugly cry yeah. like she kind of she just lets it she's like i don't care which way my face is going i'm going to just i'm gonna cry i'm gonna be in this moment and i think that that's the reason people are drawn to her is because you she gives she just feels like she's authentic yes mm -hmm. you know here's a question cammy can your can your kids separate jennifer lawrence from katniss everdeen like or do they look at jennifer lawrence and just go katniss or do they recognize her as a as jennifer lawrence she's a great actress no they call her katniss and like she was in silver linings playbook but my children haven't seen it so right. i don't Obviously. know i'm trying to think where would they have seen her yeah. right now but when they talk about her my daughter's read all the books she's reading them again she totally loves it um and you know my boys 10 and 12 are catching up and they they love the movie as well but when they refer to them it's all in character it's mm -hmm. 
Katniss. Yep. They think it's yep. adorable that um, Gail calls her catnip. You know, <laughs> those teens are all into that. So mm-hmm. to them, she is a character and they love her. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, American Hustle's rated R, yeah, I believe, as like well. And, and SLP Bone was and rated R. So Bone. everything else she's played is kind of beyond those years. So they don't right. see X-Men. her. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't. Do, so yeah, right now it's all there. She's Cat S. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. But I think for like, it depends on like the audience. I think that because of Silver Linings, I would say most people. It's Jennifer Lawrence, I would say. I, w- oh. I would say that too, though, especially mm-hmm. for adults. I think it's mm-hmm. Jennifer Lawrence, and she's on fire, not just Katniss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look at you. <laughs> nice. Yeah. nice. Yes. All right. With that, let's move on to music, because, Phil, I, like, I liked what you had to say about the music in this, and you want to elaborate on what you were saying earlier? Uh, sure. Uh, so, so in the fog scene specifically, um, <laughs> No, you know, obviously uh, James Newton Howard did this, and I, I like him. Uh, we always talk about Hans Zimmer, and I think every yeah. movie that we've done, that <laughs> right? I know, right? He does Zimmer. so many. <laughs> that I'm glad we're talking about James Newton Howard because I think you know um, he's right, right there um, in that camp. Um, there was an interesting one with the fog where it literally sounded like Psycho. Yeah, you know mm-hmm. where uh, for those of you who've seen the movie where where mm-hmm. the main character. Where the female character, because it ironically switches yeah. characters, um, she's running away, and it's that sort of um, weird sense of you know trying to escape, and and I thought that they used it uh, well. There's a lot of eerie music in this score. Like um, going back, I watched it twice, and I was kind of shocked by um, even in the ballroom dance scene, they mm-hmm. had a lot of darker music, a lot more creepy. I guess I would say, although that's a really intelligent word for it, <laughs> is that there's creepy music in yeah, this one. It, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it I mean, is conveying an emotion. Mm-hmm. So creepy, I think, was a very effective way of saying it because, and I, I think that was fitting because, I, you know, there's not a lot of light in this movie. <laughs> no, and it's, <laughs> it's a creepy it. scene. But, you know, but then again, he can become very gladiator-esque, arena-esque, mm-hmm. you know, as we opened up the show with. You got to remember, this guy started out in 1985. He knows his way. <laughs> I mean, he, you know, he's done things like head office. Uh, get, I mean, he's been around, and so he knows his way around. And uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. He's done big. He's done small. And I think he's doing Mockingjay parts. Yeah, I guess, he's, he's I guess doing my, one and two. And, I guess just like to my ears, a lot of the grandiose music mm-hmm. or like the Mockingjay song, all of that. Any of the happier liner music was all references to the first film. Mm. They felt very, very similar. Anything that was new, creative, I didn't feel like there was a lot of new... All of the new music to me was very creepy. Um, Mm. I thought that while he did capture more of a gladiator type sound, that was more drawn from film number one Mm -hmm. than his own... I thought thought it was interesting where, um, you know... uh, with his other movies, like specifically Blood Diamond, right. um, there's a lot of different emotion in that movie, but there's a there's a motif of sounds and things like that. In this one, uh, he kind of whatever whatever needed to fit in a scene, that's what he created, rather yeah. than kind of you know because if I'm sure if you listen to the soundtrack of this, it, it, there's no kind of pattern in, through line, at right. least to me. Which yeah, there's some great lightning effects. So you didn't notice any recurring themes? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I did not, you know, I th- yeah, you know, I obviously the Mockingjay things like that. Right. Like I, I felt that would have been a bigger motif in some of the songs and things like that. You know, for when hope was coming or when right. hope was, you know, coming down, you could have, you know, you could have taken that away or mm-hmm. something like that. And I, I, I thought that would have been cool to play with, but I think, you know, they made the effort to what, what, what would they? they it's almost like they took the scene apart from the whole movie and right. was like, okay, what's going to make this scene? the best forget the rest of the movie you know and, and, and it, it works I, I have a question though like <clears throat> because we do talk about Hans Zimmer and you know you have to bring up uh, John Williams and such I, I, I don't notice if there is a theme for like does Katniss have a theme does Katniss Joanna does have a theme ha- actually have um, the the first movie in the Hunger Games there there is a soundtrack out there that has like Katniss theme, Gail, Peta, and mm-hmm. then um, them entering the capital, and in, and then them entering mm-hmm. to the arena. There are like individual sounds, sure, um, the soundtracks, musical themes for, for them. your characters yeah. and places. And I agree because we, 
I think it's at the point where Hans Zimmer, he's done so many movies and stuff. When you hear his music, you can tell it's him. He has like the same foundation for all of his scores, and then he va- he varies it up and makes it a little bit different here and there. I think feel with the James Newton's Howard's music, there's different. Each track is different. It has their own personality and feel, and it, it complements each scene that goes goes with it. Yeah, but I, I guess what I'm getting, I didn't, conv- I didn't. To me, it wasn't conveyed going into Hunger Games outside of the, the Hunger Games theme that mm-hmm. each. I didn't know. Did you notice that the themes carried over into this movie outside of the Mockingjay thing? Which, I would say Mockingjay mm-hmm. and a lot of the capital sound effects, capital entrances, right. were reminiscent. Anything in the arena, um, which I felt like was all very eerie spooky um and that was all new to me and i'm am i the only one who thinks that the mocking jay whistle is like right f- out of x files kind of a little bit <laughs> yeah i, I just know. think x files whenever i hear it mm-hmm. yeah. i mean i, I mean, they will say on the soundtrack they've got a lot of big names coming out like I want to say that they have Lord on there. I think they have Coldplay on there. Yeah, Coldplay. You're, you're, yeah, yeah but you're talking awesome. about. I'm talking about the you're soundtrack talking that they've about like the, identified. I'm not talking about the score underlying. Right. The movie. You're talking about the I'm one manufactured about, for yes, the movie. Yes, yeah. that is what I'm talking about. So they are playing up that end. Yeah, and I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And they good. want kids to buy the CD. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sure sense. they will. Yeah, <laughs> I know they will. And at the <laughs> end, <laughs> at the end, it's Coldplay. It is the end playing. credits and but, and the cre- oh my gosh I don't know if you guys stayed through the credits I'm just in the habit of staying through the mm-hmm. credits now not only because respect <laughs> not only because of that or because of anything but I just like to sit there and like let it sink in or whatever mm-hmm. and I stayed through their whole credits and they had the longest credits mm-hmm. and in one part that was really funny like it, they put like the Hunger Games catching fire and it's like eh, you know this big on the tiny screen. in the screen yeah and then they put Lionsgate and it was, Whoa! <laughs> it was right after and it was shocker so, yeah. it was I, you know, I was like I couldn't stay I, I had had a big gulp Coke mm-hmm. Zero and so once Coke <laughs> okay, played yeah. <laughs> I had to I run stayed. out I, had very anymore. long credits like right. tons of people on yeah. this movie I want to say it went through like four songs and it was it was a long one yeah which I mean it showed it was big budget it was big scale and I think it also goes with it. the sound effects that was used in this movie mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. with the when the fog crept in that was really eerie to watch because you, well, what's more scary is nature you can't really control that unless you're in the arena and you're part mm-hmm. of the game but uh, like just the sound effects for the boiling of the all the boils that they had mm-hmm. that was yeah. hard to even and makeup to. wise they were really they were CGI however those yeah, boils yeah. were yeah, yeah put on they did a really nice job and again i think it's to me this is where the change is like we went from the original arena to hunger games catching fire sort of becomes an action movie because it isn't so much of staying alive from your other tributes it's it's escaping fog it's escaping like crazy apes it's Mm -hmm. escaping big floods it's escaping you know something that spins around in the water Mm -hmm. and like throw it it was to me, that's more of akin to like an action movie, like what you're running away from uh, and trying to figure out why you're running away from. Well, these to that things. point, you know, uh, so, you know, the biggest the biggest problem of everyone for the first movie was that it was all on handheld. This was a lot yeah. more cinematic. And this, yeah. in fact, the the Hunger Games were I want to say all of it right. were shot on IMAX. Film. Yeah, I mean, I saw it in a true IMAX theater and I was I was actually I was very surprised that the entire that entire sequence which is about 20 minutes half hour i mean it was a good which chunk sequence? of it the- when they got to the arena oh, okay good. as that soon as a big part yeah. as soon as she gets onto the elevator mm-hmm. um if you're watching if you're watching the movie in like a, a true imax mm-hmm. as soon as she got into that elevator and was going up and she got up it went from the rectangular screen to the eight story screen i was like oh okay great and then i noticed wow they're they filmed this entire sequence that mm-hmm. way. Kudos to them because they used it to great effect. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, most recently in the past, we've had people like um, Christopher Nolan has used it in the last two Dark Knight movies, but he's only used it in certain scenes. This one was like an entire, like it wasn't just World. scenes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was as they were in the arena fighting and it looked lush. Um, 
you know, Hawaii looked beautiful and it, it was great. What I thought was the, the real testament to the, to the whole arena scene is that it was partially filmed in Atlanta at, in a pond in November. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, like they, they filmed the cornucopia. Very hot. Right? It was, was filmed in a water park in Atlanta that they couldn't get to until the water park closed sure, down in yeah. September. And then they had to make it up for mm. the movie. So they made the cornucopia and the spindles. Yeah. And then they had to green screen everything, make sure, take care of the paparazzi so, the, so they can't peek in. By the time they were able to film, it was November. And they had giant water heaters in the water to try to heat it, but it, it got no warmer than 40 degrees. Whoa. So the scene where she jumps off, mm -hmm. you know, the, the woman who plays Mags, they couldn't keep her, they had to get her out of the water because her blood pressure would go high. And, mm -hmm. you know, they said that that was probably one of the most daunting parts to film because the water was just so cold yeah, and doing it. And then they filmed all the beach scenes were filmed in Hawaii. Mm -hmm seamless to me i thought that was when i learned that they filmed that stuff in atlanta and then they blend it into hawaii it's amazing that's good special effects very seamless i would have never known uh nice little yeah. piece of movie magic also the way they shot it too we saw a lot of the on the camera going into the water and you felt like sure. you were drowning like the other tributes and mm -hmm. you were really part of that action yeah i yeah. kept wondering why they kept having waves crashing on the beach though we were in a lake and I kept hearing the, the <laughs> ocean waves. I was like, why? Are we it was the waves? giant wave that <laughs> yeah. came, that came <laughs> down the mountain. Yeah, but they're just and sitting there just on the beach <laughs> and I'm hearing <laughs> the crashing. I was like, uh, I don't think there are that many waves. <laughs> it was in because the lake. of the big wave that just kept okay, happening. Right. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah, I appreciate that. So By the way, speaking of mind. Atlanta, certain capital scenes were filmed in the Atlanta Marriott Hotel. Mm. Because of the Dragon Con convention was there, so it played nicely into nice. some of go. their scenes. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Very nice. All right. All right. Well, so, uh, we've talked a little bit about this, but it's since we haven't really got into the whole thing about it, the <coughs> shooting Pardon style me. and everything like that. I think everybody. It's it's kind of universal. Everybody loves the way this was shot way better than the previous one. Yeah. I don't know anybody that liked the first one better. Anybody? Anybody here? I liked the first movie for what it is. I didn't go into that movie, come out of it being like, I don't like it. I liked the first movie. I liked this one more. I think that movies are great when they grow. It's yeah. like the same as I'm going to relate this to Harry Potter. Like, first Harry Potter films, when I go back, I'm like, mm -hmm. they definitely got better. But I liked that. Mm -hmm. I like that things can grow. I like that you grow with them. So to me, I'm not going to go back and knock the first one for not for being on shaky cam because it didn't bother me then. Mm -hmm. And I like that there's a difference. I like that there's a growth. So yes, I like this one better. Yes, I like how it was shot better. But I'm not dissing the first one. Sorry. I'm sorry, but I wasn't asking <laughs> who to. I'm just saying. <laughs> I like the second I was trying one to get better. into controversies yeah. here. Everything because, she well, said. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did have a problem with the first one. I mean, the, the shaky cam was used so much in scenes where people were just talking. Like, there was no need to have shaky cam going on. Mm -hmm. This one, they really, they, they, they aced that. But again, largely, you know, Jill Willems is a cinematographer. Right. You know, when you're filming in IMAX, <clears throat> in a sense, you have to film it. You have to almost look at it as, as 3D. It's, it's different from filming in your regular conventional way. You have such a bigger format to work with. And, you know, it's for Joe Williams, it was it made things to him look very fresh, real. He could get these close ups and he, he was able to make it look artful. And you did see a lot of close ups of, of Katniss and mm -hmm. things. And uh, let me tell you, when it's in, I'm going to assume any large screen specialty format. You know, I would recommend if you are seeing the movie again, go out of your way to find a large format theater because that part was fantastic. And, and they used if the for no IMAX. other reason you can compare and contrast what mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. the experience of it being an IMAX or not. Yeah, you know, and we, it just looked great. Mm -hmm. I liked about, you know, in terms of it being a little bit quote unquote cin cinematic, what played off well was that they, you know, uh, now they were trying to be a little bit more cinematic with the presentation of everything, right? The whole build up to the wedding and yeah. the victory tour and things yeah. like that. And so it's supposed to be this nice facade of, you know, but they're not. Absolutely. Well, yeah. And so let it played me, off well. Let me throw this out there because Francis Lawrence was also, um, he said that prior to going into filming it for prep, he was looking at movies like Apocalypse Now and Platoon. 
Mm-hmm. Now, <laughs> well, you know, well, and he's like, you know, deaths. movies about, yeah. yeah. And, and well, he, I can see know, the comparison. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but not just look wise. I think mm-hmm. he was looking at it as the consequences of war, mm-hmm. you know, and how does he put that into this movie? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not entirely sure, you know, you get to the, you get to the heft of those mm-hmm. pictures. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the third. Mm-hmm. If that's yeah. going to, I mean, so I think that he's even, I know uh, he did an interview with Wired, uh, Francis and Lawrence, and he even said like the real, the meaning or like that sector is going yeah. to be really pushed in. Sure. Either, who knows, maybe the third or fourth. I don't know which installment. Um, but, and, but we are, he's not going to, we're not going to get the IMAX as much filming wise. I mean, mm-hmm. it'll probably show an IMAX, like you said, so, go see the IMAX one of this one to get that. Sure. And then, but don't expect it in the next one. Well, I mean, it, it, they may not film in IMAX, but my guess I'm, is it'll be it'll in the out. large, yeah. it'll yeah. come yeah. out in the yeah. large, yeah. you know, the large screen format. You know, it's, oh, look, we're going to get into these, we're going to get into that third book and... I don't know if we want to talk about it now. If we had something else in the schedule, yeah, we can talk about it right now. I, mean, I want to go into the controversy of it because I've been kind of holding like. Yeah, I mean, it. you know, I don't. And I he, just, I just like the third book to me, and I'm not going to spoil any. I like I'm not going to give any plot points that spoil anything mm-hmm. for our non-readers. This isn't a book club. We're talking about movies, but the third book to me was, I didn't like it at all. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it was god awful. So much that I can't I can't recommend the series right. to anybody okay. because of that third book. And I think they're either going to and first making it into two movies it This goes look, into your controversy, it's, it's, making it's, it into it. two exactly. movies. Making it into two saying. movies is such Well, two things. One, there's a lot of people that think the movies are better than the source material. And two, why if that's the case, and I'm not saying it is, but let we can discuss that, but why are they dragging the last one out to two? Money. If it's, well, clearly, yeah, but that's that's one of the reasons that that, 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 that that there's a controversy. We understand it from a business standpoint, but a lot of people are not happy with it. It's it's annoying to me. Um it's getting overused. I understood it. I understand it when you have a book that's thousand pages long, like that's impossible like to share. Yeah. yeah, but this book is the same length as this one. Mm-hmm. I don't think you really need it, especially because I don't know. I think that there are going to be certain scenes in that next book that I really can envision being shot very quickly. Um, I don't think you need a lot of film time for it so i think it's possible for my own imagination to be able to do it in one film so mm-hmm. it, it does bother me and i don't want to wait the time in between i want to be able to see this in three movies i read it in three books yeah. and mm-hmm. that's how i want to experience it again i am a fan of this books so yeah why are you, why are you changing i it? couldn't agree with you more and I, and I think you know a lot of people said well blame harry potter and i'll blame <laughs> harry potter and i'll and but i'll also commend harry potter when they first mentioned that they were going to do Deathly Hallows in two books, I was like, "Oh, come on, Warner Brothers! You know it's your last movie, so now you gotta, you gotta, mm-hmm. you gotta stretch it out as far as you can to to squeeze every dollar out of it." Okay, that's fine. The book's like twelve to fourteen hundred pages long. Yeah. And then when I saw the adaptation, mm-hmm. and number one, it was months. It, we didn't have to wait years for the second one for mm-hmm. part two to come out. But when they did it. And after I saw it, and I saw it as two parts, after, I was like, okay, that makes sense. Because as a fan of the mm-hmm. books, I was like, they hit everything that's important in this entire series, and they wrapped it up the way that it should be wrapped up, and they didn't take shortcuts. I said, okay. Then Twilight does it. Now, I didn't read the Twilight books. No, only saw to. one movie with you, and whatever. Obviously, <laughs> it was a cash grab scene. Now we've got the second Hobbit movie coming out. One book, folks, and out of the entire Lord of the Rings thing, it's the shortest book, but yet we're getting three movies out of that. It's like, and, are we and, getting three? Yeah. yeah oh my gosh, three. I totally missed that. Yeah, there's another what? one. And and Phil, were we talking? Like, was it a rumor? Maybe four? Are they like, serious? Yeah. Yeah. It's three. Uh, in the, uh, yeah. If I forget, I think. We're, joke. Yeah. Oh my God! Don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, just don't. Just seems, okay. Those moves are way too long. But yeah. And yeah, and, 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 and again, and then when you come to Mockingjay. Which is under 400 pages long. And again, they're going to have to do, in my opinion, for whatever that's worth, they're going to have to either overhaul the script and the book and, you know, do something different to make it worthy of two stories. 
uh, or else they're going to have problems because you can go online. I'm, it's not just me. You can go online, look up Mockingjay, and it is the least liked book in the trilogy. And they they're gonna they're gonna run into a problem unless, unless they maybe overhaul. they're trying to make it so everyone likes it. I don't exactly. know exactly. Well, well, that's yeah. what I mean. That's why. They, well, that's what I'm saying because yeah. for me, this movie. I mean, it really sets up the last movie. I mean, it, 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 you know, there are some mm-hmm. people, myself included, that go, well, "I just saw a two and a half hour trailer for the next movie." <laughs> that's a good way See, to look at it. Sure. My thing is that like reading Mac and Jay, it's like where in the book are they going to decide where to split it? A closet. It's going to be a closet. It, <laughs> it makes sense where they split Harry Potter, you know. Right. That, that was the big climax there. But, like, reading Mike and Jade, there's really no good point to split it. No. Or to say this is the ending point of yeah. the first half. Mm-hmm. Now, Cammie, you've lived vicariously through your daughter as far as Mockingjay goes. Mm-hmm. What is her? What are her thoughts? Like she li- Again, she likes it. She's 14. She's reading it again after we saw Catching Fire. She right. wanted mm-hmm. to read it again because she was very, very excited. Uh, for this and she hasn't said anything negative like this is the the last book i haven't read um i'm just getting tidbits from her and what she's telling me and then what we've discussed so i am concerned especially with it only being not even 400 pages how will they split this up into two films i think they are going to have to add a lot Mm -hmm. um maybe do some backstory like we talked about Hamish not really knowing his character Mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't set it up in catching fire you didn't really see him maybe they're going to add a lot maybe they're going to go into district 13 a lot more they're going to need to do something to keep that audience because with it being another whole year before part two comes out you're going to lose a lot of the fans if you're not keeping their interest there so they've got to do something i agree the third the third book really does give the back story to all the characters that we know right now we've just seen them we know them like on the surface level but the third book does go in detail with Baxter of Hamish and Finnick and even Peta and Gail and how they met so mm-hmm. like I can understand if they're going to use the second um the third movie and the fourth movie to just uh, get away explain from that and get, and get away people? from the action but to explain the characters more yeah well, i mean gotta, it can't be all backstory i hope i mean no, no you gotta have some action right even, well, yeah, yeah, even just, that will get boring to watch that's what yeah. i'm saying yeah. I, since i don't know the third book i'm going god i hope it's not all backstory because i've only seen the second one and now i'm gonna go back and learn all this stuff that i probably should have known before, in the before right and 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 you have to know something and again I mean, it's not a plot point spoiler but we are in a completely different setting Mm -hmm. and one thing i'm the one thing i am going to spoil because it's one of the things that just caught me off guard of the book the third book out of the entire series is ultra ultra violent like to the point of when i was reading it going this is a young adult novel like i was it was crazy violent Wow, I'm not, I'm, and, I had I had no idea. And, not prepared for that. Okay, yeah, but, no, but that, but, that but goes our next controversy. Into, is yeah, is it's, Kat it's, a good role model? There's a lot of people saying ah, that she's not a role Dimitri's model. And so, it. if you're saying that, I assume that she's partaking well, in some Jennifer of the, Lawrence, creating well, a lot Jennifer of Jennifer Lawrence says that Katniss is a good role model. She has right. said that. Yeah, uh, I believe so. I believe in interviews well, she really identifies. She says there's no. I this isn't speaking to what Katniss is going to become, or but it's been in the past. She has said that she really respects Katniss as a character and she's really lucky to play her, mm-hmm. that there's no other female leads out there like her. And she, I think, does, from the interviews I've watched, mm-hmm. it gives off the impression that she thinks Katniss is a good role model. Mm-hmm. Well, I can understand the belief of the, you know, the values, strong values that Katniss has, you know, standing up for mm-hmm. what you believe in. If something's right, you should go against, or if something's wrong, you should stand up against that. So the I understand, family, like, for, mm-hmm. yeah, family values, friend values, and sacrificing, and having strength just as a mm-hmm. character and person. Should not be completely motivated by some, like, boy it, or something. Ex- mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, just right. so I can understand where people might find those qualities admirable. I yeah, agree. no, and I again, I, I don't want to. I'm not going to dissect the third book, but this is something interesting. I remember, I remember the third book because it left such a ugh <laughs> feeling with me. I, I like literally. That's, if that's, I that's kind of like if, saying creepy if, with me. Yeah, yeah if, if I didn't have like the physical copy, if if right. I wasn't reading it on my electronic device, mm-hmm. I would have thrown the physical copy up against the wall. I have a friend of mine who was so <laughs> angered by it but that I he I, actually I, yeah, that's how he I felt actually. <laughs> He actually took the book back when he was done. What? He like, oh. and you know, I'm just not gonna be part of the marketing campaign no. for the third book. <laughs> mocking no, no, well, no, but, no, but hey, they have the opportunity. But if uh, they're gonna re, if they're gonna like mm-hmm. really sit down okay, and go, so we have a problem here and redo the, it. So for the character of Cass, Katniss as is, because we don't know what they're doing, we don't mm-hmm. know how they're transforming her. 
And maybe they will continue to make her a good role model as she is now. As the character she is now and what we've seen, is this a good story, good thing to look up to? As of now, it's a good story, but I don't think she's a role model yet. She hasn't accepted she hasn't accepted the, the notion of responsibility yeah she's she, the hope and all that other stuff, she doesn't so. want it yet you know all she wants <laughs> i mean midway through the movie she wants to run away because that's what she wants and you know she's going to do these hunger games and the only goal is to save Peter because he's worth more saving than her but other than that there's no long-term she hasn't goal to take really gained anything. an awareness of how much power she has yeah exactly because this movie she's reluctant and she's going against it and the third one she actually accepts it even mm. Even though right. she's reluctant, she fully accepts the right. Character. And I think the difference with a character like this is it's it's so different than like a Disney character or a princess or how a lot of girls are characterized in these kind of films. Usually, they're help the, the helpless one, the man's the strong one, gets him out of every situation. Mm-hmm. She's actually got the upper hand. She takes yeah. care of Peta. She's been taking care of her mom and sister. She's taking care of her community or her district. And so I think for young girls watching this, they're identifying with, you can be strong, you can be independent, you can be all these great things. So in a way, you're you're right, Phil. She hasn't got to that point where she's accepted it herself, but already just watching her on screen, these girls are identifying with all these other great points mm-hmm. that Katniss is portraying. Mm-hmm. I agree. I totally agree. Exactly. Like, I, I think that she is someone that, people want to be and want to be a part of so i think as of right now i again it's (laughs) but we can only judge us we're not going to third yet because we are hopeful they are going to add some or the fourth one will come back here and and we can rehash what's happened to her because you never well what i i like about the character that i've seen is that uh, she's not so one-dimensional that you can say she's a hero yet Mm-hmm. And I like that she's got she has conflict in her and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So yes, I think she's a role model on the fact that she stands up for herself. She wants to do what's right, all those kinds of things. But you also see that she's got frailty. She makes bad decisions sometimes mm-hmm. right. because she's still in the middle of that quote arc. Mm-hmm. So is she a role model now? Yeah, be, uh, because she's a human being. She's fully realized in that sense. But I mean, she hasn't stepped up to whatever responsibility that someone's going to lay on her and everything. But just the fact that she's trying to be authentic and trying to do the right thing right there is enough. Yeah, yes. the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me ask you guys this: in terms, of, any, oh. in, in terms of the controversy, mm-hmm. though, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of there, there are fans that are saying that this movie is exactly like the first one. Yeah, and this well, is yeah. Like, she's she she go you know she's part of this. It's tribute. almost a repeat rather than a. And she goes a into the Hunger Games. You know, we see the whole setup, mm-hmm. although it's shortened because you know it's assumed that people have seen the first one, so they kind of understand the culture. And then she's there, and she quote unquote wins or whatever. At least it ends. And we're set up for the next movie. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Because uh, I mean, she's it, the same it, person in one and two. No, that's I mean, kind no, of the that, same the, movie. The beats for more or less repeat with minor alterations. I mean, obviously, I guess, her and Snow interact in a different. But again, it, it should have by at this point progressed more. I I I haven't thought that personally, um, especially how I would say how they're introduced. I mean, Katniss in the first one, just in the reaping, how that's such a shock. How there's so much. She's motivated by passion for a love of family to like the second reaping where she goes in so strong and ready and not going to break down. Um, I think that's a change to her introduction into the cornucopia. First fleeing and trying to figure out strategy. The second one, her going straight for the weapons and being really a part of the action. Um, I think that she does possess a layer of intelligence and strategy in the second one as opposed to the first. So I think she is growing and I do think it's different. I, well, I agree because I can see why people say it's like the same one because the story, the, the big story line overall, it's the same. She finds she, out that she has to go to the game. She's going to the games again. There's the whole reaping mm-hmm. and all like... Get going through the arena oh, with all the mm-hmm. tributes, like all those are the same and getting interviewed by Caesar, like we've seen all that in the first one and she's doing it again for the second one for the quarter quill and so I can see why people think mm-hmm. that's the same but and the they, character grows for all these different people that she's interacting with are different yeah and they're giving you the exact same settings and giving you her a different reaction mm-hmm. um, even more so before in the training grounds where in the first training she's supposed to hide her skills in the second film we see her really show everything she can do but we saw her in the first film shoot an arrow at the apple and the pig and that's a big shock to the fact that she does recognize 
what the danger is for them and like how she's influencing the game maker's life and how she her biggest asset or her 10 minutes to show what she can do is she can get a game maker killed it's like mm-hmm. uh, here's i think people, that's a big here's change. What i, I it, when i was reading the second book mm-hmm. i mean i'll be honest i did think uh second verse same as the first it is a it's what a hollywood sequel should be you want it to be bigger so they made the games bigger um you know you want some character growth. Well, they gave us some character growth, but ultimately what happened was it just, you're right, Phil. I mean, to me, it did hit the same beats. We ended up back into another arena and we had the Hunger Games, uh, you know, all over again. It was what a, a Hollywood sequel, it, it was bigger, it was louder. They they added more conflict inside the arena. So they added yeah, more all sounds of those in things. the arena because in the first movie, Absolutely. right when the cannon goes off or, or when they sure. sound off the alarm, there's literally no sound. You just see the chaos of all right. the kids killing each other. Yeah. And this time, when the alarm goes off, you hear everything. Right. And what I what we talked about earlier, what I will say is different about this movie is the look. Mm-hmm. You know this this has a look of a bigger movie. So you know I thought that. They did a good job in mm-hmm. that way, um, you know, and even though hitting the beats, you know, we, we've become a bigger movie. Our arena is bigger. We have more we have more danger in the arena. So in those aspects, it's they, different. I but you're that, right, Phil. I think that it hits the same beats pretty much almost to the T with the exception of the end. This one is not a complete how'd movie. How do you feel about the end? I Okay, I'm, I'm totally fine with it being a cliffhanger. I like that it's a cliffhanger. The book. Hello. The cliffhanger? By the way, guys, if you didn't notice, we had a little bit of a switcheroo. A little switch. <laughs> um, John, but I'm talking about the last, last frame of how we have Katniss, we have the camera from above, we have it looking at her face, and her eyes are searching, and then for the last second, we have like the direct contact straight in. Uh, how are you guys feeling? I want to hear everyone else's opinion before I get around. Okay, a lot of certain filmmakers from this movie worked on um, the Matrix trilogy, uh-huh. right? Mm-hmm. It reminds me of Matrix Reloaded, that last shot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I think they borrowed that idea. And for me, partly, as we're talking, my biggest frustration is that this, for me, the legacy of this quadrilogy will be held or destroyed upon you know parts one and part two of how it kind of turns out because okay all this setup you know it could lead to everything or mm-hmm. it could lead to nothing and if it leads to nothing people are gonna be really angry yeah this mm-hmm. I, I i thought there there were a lot of different things to this very last shot because it was a nice bookend to the movie because the very first shot in the movie katniss is looking out Out. at district 12 at her whole homeland Mm -hmm. and then the last shot is her realization that her home is no more there is no more district 12 so i thought that those were that was a nice bookend and the fact that her character breaks the fourth wall looking directly at the camera i'm like oh she's pissed Mm -hmm. or in and but I thought that was an interesting choice why they did that. I don't think it was needed, though. Well, interesting, because to me, the the movie pretty much ended the same way the book did. You know, the book ended on a cliffhanger. There is no District 12, and we know that there's, like, yeah. District 13. And I don't know. It's sort of, to me, I was just expecting it. I was expecting the cliffhanger to happen, and they delivered it, and that's fine. You know, if you take Joss Whedon's uh, look at movies, Joss we okay, everybody... For the most part, a majority of people accept that Empire Strikes Back is the best of the original trilogy, if you ask anybody about Star Wars. But Joss Whedon goes, you know, it's really not. The original Star Wars is mine. My problem with Empire Strikes Back is it is not a complete movie. It doesn't have an end. It doesn't end. And I guess to your point, where or was it Phil's, like maybe if we had had something to bring in from from 3... Mm-hmm. To, to showcase it, it's okay to sort of kind of leave it on a cliffhanger look they stay true to the book and that i think fans is what wants it's fine that it's not an incomplete movie because we already know we're getting parts one and parts two of mocking yeah. if the movie tanked if the, there wouldn't be really they, they wouldn't live that right would be an awful way to end I, a movie like golden compass mm-hmm. the original mm-hmm. golden compass movie that, that movie ended on a cliffhanger mm-hmm. and we've ne- <laughs> we're and never we gonna never get to see it, it. Yeah, really who cares the, the so. thing i gotta I say care. 
I care. I care because I love that book. But I thought they um, did a good job. Yeah, the thing about uh, the the cliffhanger, I actually, the first time I had read Catching Fire, I had no idea that that was going to end like that. And I have witnesses when I read it. I was surrounded by my my roommates. We were in a bus? No, I I was in a room surrounded by my roommates, and I just stand up. I'm like, what? <laughs> I threw the book down and I walked out. I, I had to go to class, but I, I was just like so mad at the end. I was like, that can't, that can't end like that. And like everyone saw that, but yeah. Well, like I had that funny. reaction. Who read the book, yeah. we understood. And so when it ended, it was like, okay, I understand. I read the book. I was expecting that almost. If you didn't read the book, again, like when we watched it, some people we were with had not read the book. Mm-hmm. They were like, ah what it just ended i want more and they Mm -hmm. were craving that and so i think they did a good job with not upsetting the audience enough where they thought well screw it i'm not going to see the next one i think they did a good job of saying well this is exciting they left a good um, cliffhanger Mm -hmm. at the end and they didn't lose their audience i think they're going to come back next year for part three now part three is going to be your catch how they do that Mm -hmm. it can either be really well or just be a flop and then you're going to lose your audience yeah phil i think you you said it the best uh, honestly sarah Sarah, you had something i would say well i brought this up because i like I knew it was going to be a cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. I liked that it was a cliffhanger. I wanted it to be more of a cliffhanger because I wanted to leave her still searching. I think it's a better preparation for her and her growth in the third book. I did not like that she broke with the fourth wall and had like that look of anger or determination or something. I didn't want that. I wanted to be more confusion. I think she came to that, re- that realization was too quick. I think that with how they ended that, she needs to come out the next movie like blazing like with a plan with a thing Mm -hmm. and i don't really see that happening i think that she still has questions to be answered and i think it's going to have to be a rewind on that last look to go back and be like oh wait i'm confused again Mm -hmm. but how she is right now it's like you expect that next movie for her to come out being like i am ready and and i'm like is that is that what you're gonna do because we need some more we need some more before that to my point though perhaps they are reworking mockingjay the book Mm -hmm. because Mm-hmm. We yeah. know, we know as readers what how the character mm-hmm. what happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So perhaps I mean because it that would be a much different tact than the Katniss yes. in the novelization of Mockingjay. That's what I'm saying. That's why it's, I find that last thing yeah. very interesting. And um, from my perspective, unless they work it like it, it needed to be cut a second shorter. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I don't think we needed the shot of her realization and her reaction to it. I think it would have been better had they cut a little bit earlier, like just her shock. Exactly. Absolute shock that right. there's no District 12 because that's what my reaction was like. <laughs> but, and, and are we going to go into, um, I don't know, what, are we going to talk uh, about overall, marketing? Yeah, or, overall, or, this this movie, it had it. A major return in the movie, like the the budget was what a hundred. This is how we're going to end this conversation million. with the actual facts, the <laughs> yeah. actual the, the, numbers. Yeah, well, okay, so you know, so we have Catching Fire opened up November twenty second, distributed by Lionsgate. We were looking at a we're looking at a total budget, and this is including what they call prints and advertising. So production mm-hmm. budget, prints and advertising, estimated to about one hundred and eighty five, which. That's estimated. I think that's a little low, but does they, that, they did. How does that compare? I mean, Dimitri, you might know this. I don't know. How does that compare to other big budget films today? It's quite small. Okay. Um, it Because, and this is where I'm sort of kind of, the marketing on this movie, Lionsgate went like all Damn. out, even more so than Hunger Games. I mean, I'm mm. watching the World Series mm-hmm. and they had like certain like series game number sixes sponsored by catching i mean it was crazy and a lot of that's money when you're talking about the big studios dumping money into like a harry potter franchise or a man of steel you sometimes when it comes to the advertising part of it you know you're you can be talking hundreds 150 200 million dollars you know according to this the production budget was 130 meaning that the marketing budget was 50 if my math is correct that's 55 million which seems extremely small for the amount of what I saw mm-hmm. as a co- consumer. I mean, look, I worked for Lionsgate for 11 years, and I know that they they always took pride in being scrappy and trying to get the best deals. And one thing that they always took pride on is marketing their movies, 
you know, with the minimalist amount of budget that mm -hmm. they had, that they had going on. So when you were marketing a Saw movie, you were marketing a Saw movie with 20 million, sometimes even less, 30, 50 million is, that, that's, Big that, that was a lot of, mm -hmm. that, at the time, 50 million would have been yeah. a lot of money for them. That's why I'm thinking 55 million. It, it seemed a hell of a lot more for what they were buying and the billboards and everywhere I looked. I mean, can we all agree? I mean, everywhere it was I looked, everywhere. it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. but, no, mm -hmm. but I mean, we are all in LA, so it could be different. Like we, I don't know what this was, how this was put to like, kind of like the rest of the world outside of yeah, Hollywood. It also, it also opened up earlier. I, we were among the last to see it. <laughs> November 22nd, that's the US, not the UK, right. not Brazil, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and all these right. other countries. So uh, yeah, they, they look, they, they pulled all the stops. They. They know what they have. Yes. And you're going to take advantage of it. they got a good return. Still, yeah. And, and, you know, listen, they, they opened up with the weekend gross domestic $158 million. Their foreign and domestic combined is $304 million. So that's that's a lot of that's a lot of and, and they've been there, back and forth know? about what actually records they are breaking right now. Um, it's mostly I'm getting confused because I mean a couple of days ago I thought they had broken like five records. It was like opening holiday weekend record, November, November record. Records. What a lot of record. Oh. What a lot of people don't completely understand and what isn't always reported. In fact, it's rarely ever reported. Um, you know, I also had to overlook grosses as well. When you're when you're calculating out grosses, you're doing you know Friday Saturday. There's, there's a program out there helps you calculate the gross. It's gotten a hell of a lot better because mm -hmm. you used to have to factor in. But the one day you have to factor in is Sunday. If you note, gross reports on Sunday come out early Sunday morning, and by early, but between eight and ten o'clock. Okay, <clears throat> you don't know how your Sunday is going to play out, so you have to use some some math. Yes. To, yeah, you have to do a guess. Educated guessing. And it is, and I will say, it is a, it is as close to educated of a guess. You have information, you have history that works with, so you know what your Friday, Friday you can pretty much project how you're going to play out because you know how a Saturday will play out. You know how Sunday will play out depending on what's going on on that mm -hmm. Sunday. And if you compare it to other similar mm -hmm. kinds of movies, so that's what you do. So what happened was, is they came out and they, re it was actually a very fascinating weekend because if you were paying attention, come Friday night, there were reports going, Catching Fire is not doing the matinee business that Hunger Games is doing. It's behind it. And it could potentially do $148 million. Mm -hmm. By Saturday early morning, it was like, Catching Fire caught up with Hunger Games. It's now going to do like 160 mm -hmm. and whatnot. Now, mind you, Building up to this weekend, mm -hmm. people were saying this movie was going to do 170, 175, and higher. It was going to be huge. So now you come into the weekend, and some people said 160, and they said, okay, it's when the, the re reports came out on Sunday, they reported $161 million. And they were just using the tools that they have. Which and, they use like every week. Which every week. But what we, but here's the, here's the rub. We as the consumer or we as, you know, the, the, the people who, who will take care who watch this, we will take that gross on a Monday morning mm -hmm. and they'll say, oh, this movie, and it doesn't matter what movie, I mean, Catching Fire because we're talking yeah. about it, the movie made $161 million yet. Well, they still haven't tallied up the Sunday gross. Mm -hmm. So we just go by gospel like, oh, it made $161 million. Well, when the final Sunday gross comes in, on many occasions... It's different. Yeah. It adjusts. Mm -hmm. um, this one adjusted. It went from 161 to 158. Mm -hmm. So at 161, it was the number four highest grossing movie, Phil. Yep, number four. And then by Monday midday, it was the sixth highest grossing opening mm -hmm. you know film listen still Lions huge Gage, still, still the number move. one Everyone's movie in happy. november yeah you know yeah. it's just, it will eventually hit too. those numbers like the next week it, yeah so. i mean listen they, they they picked a great date because mm -hmm. the only thing they're really going to no one's going to be watching that and you know the movies we'll see i don't know if frozen is going to play into taking away gross i don't think ooh, a home front Pardon me, with Jason Statham opens up this week. Look, they have a good week. Yes, mm -hmm. you know the the uh, the audience generally likes it. I think it got an A A minus in Cinema Score. 
It's doing very, very well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you IMDb know. is 8.3. Rotten Tomatoes. The Tater Meter is 89%. The audience is 94%. Right. People are happy. So, and if you think about it, also, November is a great month for, like, Oscar movies to come out, like, big movies that to get uh, re- recognized right. in that way. If And also, Twilight came out in, like, mm-hmm. November as well. So, right. they've... The team. People have realized November is a good month. Well, but November has always been a good month. Harry mm-hmm. Potter was released in November. Yeah, November. You know, those movies, I mean, it's, it's right now we are in the start of what they call the holiday. We are in the start of the holiday season cinematically. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm actually surprised that there aren't bigger movies being released mm-hmm. right now. I mean, it's basically catching fire. That's why for Lionsgate, people it was didn't a great, want to compete. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. People yeah. didn't want to see yeah. Yeah. So and I think crazy. I think it's going to hold on this weekend too. I yeah, think absolutely. It's going to be great. Absolutely, and I think you're going to get a lot of repeat viewing. Mm-hmm. You're going to get the similar to what happened with Twilight. I think the only question that 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 needs to be asked is, have they expanded their audience or are they going to ceiling out? And I think they did expand. I think they really got the male viewer, especially in this film. And I agree with Sarah because my husband wasn't interested in the first one, and for some reason he was excited to see the second one. And my boys, and now Mm -hmm. we're we're all watching it. So I think they they did. I think they did a good job. And a lot of that I think was because of the action. I think Catching Fire you had a lot more action. Yeah, Um, it was more of an action movie, which was capturing your your male audience. I think that also goes to Phil. I don't want to speak for him, but he didn't really read the books and whatnot but you saw the movies you got into it afterwards i did i i I got into the first one um very much so i mean for me ironically enough it's not necessarily the action it's the idea behind it and i like this this dystopian um idea and that's why for me i want to know more about the rebellion and things like that and i'm really hoping to i want to see that more um i did find um there's been comparisons made between the premiere and Hunger Games for the sole reason that, you know, they had this big red carpet and our our very good friend Ben Lyons was kind of the host, but they compared it to Stanley Tucci of like, wow, he's just entertaining people <laughs> in that way because, uh, you know, we're all supposed to forget. Okay, the Hunger Games are a spectacle. <laughs> this movie is a spectacle. The red carpet's going to be a spectacle. Of course, there's comparisons. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Right. Sorry to so cut you off, Phil. Over- Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 this is all a spectacle. But overall, this movie, one of my favorites of 2013. I'm a huge fan of the books. I read them before they made were into movies. And overall, I'm looking forward to the third and fourth movie because even though they're maybe split into two. Maybe they'll combine it into one. Maybe. No. But like, I, no. I know that Danny Strong, the actor Danny Strong and writer, he's won an Emmy for, uh, I believe, it, what was it called? Oh, goodness, I had an I had it. But he, he's an Emmy winner for Game Change. And they've That's got some it. heavy hitters coming in. Yeah, I and say Julianne he's, Moore. In, he's also in charge of the writing for the third and fourth movie. So big names are coming and going to be a part of the uh, upcoming movies. But and I'm you looking know, forward it, to it. It's, it's, it's interesting, you know, we're talking about how they're splitting it up, but they're filming it as one movie, right? right. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. They, they're on a very short break. Mo- not They've not already started they, filming. They're filming right now as we speak. <laughs> yeah. Well, right now, right now they're on a short break press break yeah, slash press Thanksgiving break. Yeah. and then as soon as Thanksgiving's done but they, they've already done mm-hmm. filming for this next time you, you know what would have been great and I, I thought I think there was a missed opportunity um, they didn't go the Back to the Future 2 route like how cool would it have been and it may have, maybe would have appeased some more people at the end of Back to the Future 2 um, they did something that no other movie had done at the time which was to have a trailer like right after it says to be concluded mm-hmm there was a trailer for Back to the Future 3. And it was on all prints about... It wasn't like an attachment. It was part mm-hmm. of the movie. Um, I don't know. I mean, I thought that would have been a really great idea. Had they it's, added a little... A teaser to the... At the end, we know it's movie. not over. And just show a teaser trailer. Show us maybe some of the stuff that you filmed. And, you know, really get people, like, excited about... I don't know. I, to me, as a marketing person it was I, I was like i was sort of hoping for that to happen but it just ended but I don't, I don't think that i mean as m- cool as an idea that is to see what's gonna be in the future i think that would have completely ruined the end with her mm-hmm. shock that there's no district 12 and i think it would have just changed that whole mode. right because if to see a scene in the next movie you would have yeah. to see something then that could it left you hanging 
if you didn't read the book saying, okay, who made it through? Who's alive? Where is she? Who is in all this? If you saw a scene into the next movie right now, it would already give you an idea of, okay, who's surviving. I don't, I don't know yeah. if, if yeah, that necessarily, necessarily would have worked. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think it gives people what you, you so you're saying fans wouldn't want to see footage right now? I'm not saying they won't <laughs> they, they, they would, of course, they would want to see sometimes footage. Sometimes you can't give people yeah. everything they want. I think right. no, but they, they would have gone crazy yeah. over it. It would have completely I don't ruined think the mood and mm-hmm. the shock value that was the ending that there's no District 12. Yeah, but I you knew that as a reader. I yeah, mean, like, I'm, we knew I that, so, that. Okay, you know. if, for but, instance, if they were going to give anything, I think they would have had to give us something that they showed in, like, in the lines already. For instance, they could have given us footage of District 12 after things, mm-hmm. or they could have given us footage of President Snow, because you know President Snow's Right, I'm pitch. not saying that you're giving away the, it's, it's, it, I'm, I'm talking about a teaser. Did. I'm not, I, I and I'm saying, cool. I don't think you need a teaser for the next one. I think you could have given something Something that we the, didn't see. Something we didn't see, but we Already. know has happened. Yes. Like what's going on? Like, Agreed. like President no, so like actually getting angry and like I don't know throwing something <laughs> in the game room. Something. Along I those think lines. the human aspects coming out where you're just getting a little greedy, Dimitri, yeah. and you want to see everything right now. Yeah, wait. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I'm I mean, they built a they built a really good world, and you know, one of the things that I love about the Matrix uh, franchise and love it or hate it, but they built a world. It was video games. It was short mo- films. It was this. And so what we're not getting at, we only have one access into this world, and that's right now through Katniss, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, they're great about, okay, you know, uh, if you go see the movie, most people are also buying the book, but there's no other avenues to enter into this quote-unquote arena, pardon the pun, I know. <laughs> but, and that that I think is missing out there for fans, and I really think they could have built such a huge franchise around that notion of like... You okay, didn't, w- didn't you hear Cammie talking about like the pink bows, bow and arrow <laughs> sets that are coming out? Expansion. Much Great. Nice. So I get that, but like you know, you want to you want to do more with it, and I don't I don't know. I think there's there's a missed opportunity. Perhaps. And I and I agree. And we can talk a little bit about the marketing of the film. I mean, for the most part, look, the movie was everywhere. Like mm-hmm. leading into this movie, if you didn't know that there was a movie called Hunger Games: Catching Fire coming out, then you're living under a rock. Um, however, I mean, for me, there are three points that came. Out. Number one, one of the things is they've paired up with Subway. Now, this isn't reinventing the wheel. We all know that huge movies pair up with various fast food kind of places, you know, but being that this is called The Hunger Games, it seems (laughs) sort of kind of weird that, you know, the subway, you know, catch fire at a subway, you know, but I had to read further in that that subway is actually donating food. I don't know if anybody knew this, but there, yeah, but you wouldn't know this from the advertising. And to me, again, I have to go back to this entire trilogy is about war and the effects of war on society and on people. Going into a subway so I can get the, the, the hot sub or whatever doesn't, that's sort of kind of, it's sort of kind of weird to me. I get it. The one thing that I don't necessarily get is the cover girl marketing and hey, you two can look like somebody from the Capitol. And I'm like, what messages are you trying to tell me here? Because if I remember correctly, we look down in the capital. The capital is gauche. There, it's it's rich. It, Katniss never says, "My God, Effie, you look beautiful today." Like there's no like, they're not made to look. It's not supposed to be fashion of the week. And when you're telling the little girls, "Hey, you too can look like somebody from the capital," I, I, to me, it's a mixed message. And I don't know what they're trying to say by going with a makeup company. To look like that when it's the capital we're fighting against. I think it's, I can understand people want the, like the idea of the capital that like this, the posh lifestyle that they don't have to worry about food or starvation or money or anything. People, and then the fact that they even look like that with the makeup and extravagant clothing, that's, it's just a lifestyle that they want. Granted, the people are shady and Sadistic, but it's not a lifestyle, lifestyle that Panem gets. They look at that lifestyle as being that's what they're rebelling against. They're saying those people have it all. We've got nothing. Like what I'm saying is it just juxtaposes what the books and what ultimately you would think that the movies are going to say. And that, I guess, is like, you know, we don't want people looking like they do in the Capitol. Well, no. I don't think that the idea was for Cover Girl to 
be this marketing campaign to look at it like that. I think they were looking at it as... How can we get makeup out of this movie? We're in the arena. They don't wear any makeup. Exactly. It's not like they're in (laughs) war. and That must be it. And and we want to promote people looking like the Capitol and like they're going to a Halloween party, et cetera. What what makeup is in this movie that we can use in any way, shape, or form? Exactly. And the way they make up Katniss, she doesn't look like a Halloween character. She's very beautiful. They, They make her up. She looks gorgeous. It's all about... You know, using makeup, and they have a lot of makeup in the film. I think CoverGirl was just trying to capture the idea of how using makeup, makeup and how different ways that you can use makeup, not that mm-hmm. you want to be a capital person. But the right. only people who are really make, wearing makeup, and they have the models look as if they just stepped out of the capital. In fact, it was one of their major marketing things. They had, like, capital couture. But and, if you look at them, they're not know. beautiful. They they almost look like they're at a Halloween party or the Rocky I, Horror Picture Show. I, I mean, <laughs> they're they're made up to the extreme. They're not attractive. I at agree, all. and that's why I'm saying it's a it's, to think, me it's a juxtapositioning of what you're trying to what you're trying to sell because the capital is not beauty, but yet exactly. you're telling little and, girls. Hey, this is okay, even though it's what in the crux of the films. Well, hopefully yeah, little girls aren't wearing makeup or yeah. too much yeah. makeup if they're too little. Hopefully, if you're wearing the makeup, you have sense to know what makeup does. That's my opinion. I don't think yeah, that... Yeah, and I think they just wanted to accentuate no. the fact yeah, that... And, and we didn't yeah. talk oh, about the wonderful. theme park. Oh, no. We didn't, talk about, the, we didn't talk about the potential like <laughs> suggestion of having a, a Hunger Games theme park. One Which, day. That's crazy. I like, got a whole other part- book before that, this happens. Yeah, we got a whole two movies. Two movies. Yeah, I know. This is going to be part two. That'd be fun <laughs> to see. Go now. Honestly, I would probably want to go to that theme park. What, you'd want to go to the cornucopia roller coaster? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like, like with sharp, sharp, sharp edges? I, you know, people and, talk about it all the time, like, oh, if we were on Hungry Games, who would live? Who would, who would win this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It like, would be the only, really? Because it would be the only, only amusement park I know of where parents would drop their kids Don't off as a form of laser tag Just dodgeball to, yeah, all yeah. these they, games they put you in about an elevator elimination. lock you in again and whoever folks comes out alive is the, we're talking the about a war things. allegory we, we're what is dodgeball <laughs> what yes. is dodgeball oh, to it's, you it's a great comedy Paintball. with ben stiller but overall Paintball. all overall, these things i great love movie, catching great fire movie. my fif- one of my favorite movies of 2000 would you put it as your favorite movie um i yeah. <laughs> okay. You know what? I, I really would because I, I love. Yeah, for drama this, whole this year? Series. Yeah, it's definitely my favorite mm-hmm. so far. I, I just remember before I even come to LA, I applied to Lionsgate and the, the blind hopes that I'd be part of Catching Fire. But yes. <laughs> and now Great you movie, are. So. Now you don't have to and be yeah. Lionsgate to be a so part. So, where can everyone find all of you in case we want to keep talking about this amazing Ladies first. franchise? Ladies Cami. Uh, Martinez at technicolor.com. And Dimitri. Right here, anatomyofamovie.com. Yes, follow us on Twitter at Movie Anatomy. Sarah. Anatomy of Movie and also at AfterBuzz TV, another podcast network. All right, and Phil. Follow uh, follow me on all these other. we got a great <laughs> slew of movies coming up. Um, and again, we could continue talking about this movie forever, just like we could do any movie, but our time does have to come to an end. Yep. Goodbye. Wah, and, wah. and you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Sarah Feeney TV. And you can follow all of us on iTunes at Anatomy of a Movie and download our podcast, rate and comment, and tell us what we're doing right and what we, you know, what we need to do better. And uh, we'll talk to you for the next movie. All right. Can't wait. Bye, all. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the rest of the Anatomy of a Movie staff, we would like to thank you for listening and subscribing to the show. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email or tweet us. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been Anatomy of a Movie.